Here is a knowledge lecture for the various titles of the Essene Zealot of the Pythagorean Order of Death, also called a Grand Master and raised from the cult of sleep. The first title is Grand Master. The title of Grand Master has come to mean of a lodge. However, the meaning of this concept, that of what is a lodge, is often overlooked. The Native Americans held sweat lodges, and many meeting places for discussion of esoteric matters are blatantly public among city dwellers. As I have stated elsewhere, even a wooded clearing can be consecrated for divine ritual by any member and numbered coven. A minimum of five regular members is preferred, and there is significantly sacred numerology and geometry to support the theory that member numbers, as well as ranks and roles, should expand according to the sequence of prime numbers. A grand master of a lodge, then, is someone who understands how to operate a basic member number lodge, or coterie, a circle of friends, as a means of sharing the experience, that is, co-guiding, along with these others, to achieve first the means for each self to accomplish its goals, and second, for the group to establish an active dynamic. These basic principles, the good of the self before the group, but the good of the group follows one's own good, are accepted as mathematical governing dynamics and comprise a fundamental premise in economics as well. Therefore, there can be more than one grand master among any prime numbered group of people. Ideally, every member would be able to consider themselves equally much the leader. However, not all ask what is a lodge, and so not all understand it by this simple definition. Therefore, in any group, there is always going to be one person prone to follow another and who, likewise, by turning their back to them, becomes the leader of yet a third. These roles have been established by anthropologists studying animals that roam in packs or tribes. The alpha member of the group is usually equally as intelligent, though more competitive, than their predecessor. This role is determined by genes, that is, whoever is most fit for this position will prevail ultimately. A procession more like the inheritance of a titular office by promotion to replace the previous holder ex officio, rather than a linear inheritance from parent to child of such status, duties, responsibilities, etc., as are entailed in entitlement to position. Whoever is the most qualified in any situation encountered by a group of equal individuals will be permitted to lead them collectively at that time and until the end of the necessity of their specific expertise. This is similar to the behavior of a colony of ants during a flood. They gather around the queen in the center to form a natural raft. These ants, all moving at the will of their queen, can then move in unison, floating in currents, and can thus travel around on the surface of the water, moving this way and that. This is also a model of the nervous system that connects countless numbers of singular neurons, nerve cells, to perform the commands of the ego, occupying each simultaneously, that unifies them all. Likewise, this is also a model of the cosmos, 
whose intergalactic filaments resemble nerves. Just as the intergalactic filaments and genetic neurons, so too does every group of people obey the principle that whoever is ahead, or in the lead, so to speak, is only guiding the whole group ahead in that direction. However, even as we see galaxies colliding into and devouring one another due to their mutual gravity, and even as we find the nerves of a living system accumulate ego over time, so too do we find a floating colony of ants that can move here and there, now with one ant steering ahead, now with another, obeys the will of the singular queen. In the same way drones are non-gendered or neuter, the male gender ants are less common, and the female queen individual and unique to each hive. We see the tertiary roles of leader, follower, and follower of the follower, established as a natural law through genetic evolution. Likewise, in secular esoterica do we maintain the value of the traditional role of alpha member in the modernized concept of a lodge grand master or group leader. However, what is it that causes the alpha member to be permitted by the other group members to lead? It is because the alpha member knows and understands not only their own role, but also those of their lessers, equals, as well. The Grand Master, thus, understands the rules of the ranks under them as naturally when they are in the lead, so to speak, as the other members permit the one to lead them. This is the same with ants, nerves, galaxies, even extra-dimensional superstrings. All of these play follow the leader among themselves. So you could say that while they are the active alpha member, the Grand Master should be considered among their group the Most High. Likewise, the second to follow after the alpha member or group leader is the Omega, or final or lowest position. The runner-up for the role of group leader is usually vilified by their acting alpha and ostracized before the whole group. However, the relationship between the alpha and omega does not end there. Far from it. It only just then has begun. The group villain is necessary for the group leader to establish their direction of leadership away from or in opposition against. Therefore, so long as there is an alpha, there will remain the need for the omega. One is opposite the other. Usually, the alpha and omega begin best friends, or are even siblings, an offspring of the elder Alpha. For one of them to prosper, however, will make the other to suffer, because between these twin or binary roles is only a closed system, and therefore has a fixed sum of inherent energy that cannot be added to nor subtracted from. Like blood pumping from one chamber of the heart to another, there is only one quantity substance that passes between the two, the Alpha and Omega. In short, they are actually equal all along, only sharing power between them in favor of one or the other to a greater or lesser degree. They are dependent on one another necessarily due to this fact. The third and final role that establishes rulership, both investing the Alpha with their authority and demanding acknowledgement as guidance by their leader, are the remaining largely silent masses. These consent to be governed by agreeing to follow the leader. 
However, they bow even lower before their chosen superior, or superiors, than the Omega, and by depriving themselves of their own authority, the silent majority follows the Omega, that is, follows their leader's first and most loyal follower, the group Nemesis. By debasing themselves, they disenfranchise themselves more than does the Alpha, the Omega, who could both otherwise exist in archetypal suspension separate from this third group. In the name of imitating the act of domination performed by their leader over the group enemy, the majority of any group repress their own urges as mere temptation and thus defeat themselves. Their groveling in the way of the leader astounds even the deposed nemesis. No matter how degraded, the group enemy will cling to the primacy of their equality to their oppressor. Equally so, the group leader can never completely deny the law of reciprocity of karma between themselves and their polar opposite. The leader is considered better the more followers they attract, which depends for quantity and quality on the Alpha's relationship to their prior equal, the Omega, now their enemy by polar opposition. If the leader interacts dynamically on a continual basis with their adversary, then their relationship will be more often imitated, and those attracted on invisible currents into their mutual wake will add and multiply in numbers. However, if two equals part ways and do not ever cross paths again, and their memories of one another are not tended to and maintained, and if their hearts grow disimpassioned towards one another, then no one will consider them opposites, nor follow one in opposition to the other, nor glorify one and vilify the other. Such should be considered the ideal situation by the wise Grand Master, that by assuming no animosity, having no adversaries, making no enemies, one can avoid depriving the silent masses of their authentic nature to self-govern, that is, to internalize archetypal duality, and thus to better themselves by self-selection. The ability to choose one's self to be their own leader, however, in itself, precedes immediately the temptation to actively vilify one's actual equals and thus to accumulate many silent followers one's self. The wise leader avoids animosity and adversities, and thus attracts no followers. The wise leader allows all to lead, and each equally. The wise grand master understands this trinity of social roles, the Alpha and Omega, able to exist autonomously alongside the silent masses. While the Alpha and Omega are equally codependent, each of the silent masses is equally independent. The wise leader sees this, avoids what is wrong, and cherishes what is right. The second title is Indigo. In the same manner as the base four tetragrammaton, or, for that matter, the pentad of Pythagoras, the color indigo is part of a group of seven variables capable of being corresponded to various other attributes that are arranged in base seven groups. For example, indigo is part of the tertiary color scheme, following from the combination of secondary tinctures from primary hues. Thus, take the primary blue of blue, red, and yellow. From thence, mix down the blue with black, 
achieving a dark, navy blue. Then, remix this with primary yellow. The blue and yellow will combine as green, while the black and yellow will render orange or burnt umber. The combination of the green with the orange yields a bluer green and a brighter blue. The result is the tertiary color, indigo. The reason that, as a color, indigo is tertiary, as opposed to the fact that it is one of the seven hues of the rainbow, is due to its being the combination to a primary color, blue, of first a hue, black, and then another primary color, yellow. Technically, black is the absence of hue and the combination of all colors. It is also necessary to mix these three elements in just the right ratios, mixing less yellow than black and less black than blue. Again, in the three ratios between indigo's component colors, we find the same trinary ratios of those between the drones, the males, and the female of an ant colony, or the three social roles of alpha, omega, and mass member. The queen is yellow, the males black, and the drones are blue. The alpha is yellow, the omega, or omegas, black, and the masses, blue. The superego is yellow, the id is black, and the ego is blue, and all of these are indigo. Indigo is itself a tertiary color, however indigo is also part of the base seven hues of the rainbow, refracted white light through a prism. On the rainbow, we see that indigo is a tertiary color between a primary color, blue, and a secondary color, violet, the combination of primary red with primary blue. The entire cycle of Roy G. Biv, from red to violet, precedes primary, secondary, primary, secondary, primary, tertiary, secondary. Indigo is the only tertiary color to appear in the base 7 rainbow scale of hues. The indication made by its presence should be clear. Indigo is opposed on the scale of hues to orange and green both, skipping over relativity to yellow. Indigo is the juxtaposed hue to orange, second from beginning and end of seven, and indigo is also the juxtaposed color to green, following from the sequence alternating primary and secondary colors in the rainbow. The terms used to describe such juxtapositions of relationship is flashing. Indigo flashes, or juxtaposes, against orange and indigo also flashes or stands out against green. In the prior case, orange is brighter than indigo, but in the latter case, indigo is brighter than green. Indigo does not juxtapose and thus does not flash with yellow as they are of equal tone or quantity of brightness in reflecting light. All the primary colors flash against one another. Yellow is brighter than red, and red is lighter than blue. The secondary colors in the rainbow also flash, such that orange stands out from green, and green stands out from violet. However, secondary violet also flashes more against the primary colors, while indigo flashes more against secondaries, orange and green. The fact that tertiary indigo flashes against secondary colors while secondary violet flashes against primaries 
is indicative of the odd seven base number system as opposed to an even numbered system such as if green were tertiary or could otherwise be dropped from the center. It is true that all the hues of rainbow light occur naturally in our planet's atmosphere except for, or at best, least occasionally, green. However, because the light that air and the clouds reflect is actually only shades of the one color we do not see them reflecting, the air and clouds of H2O are actually green, and just so, all the terrestrial shades of chlorophyll in plants are only reflecting the one color of light they do not absorb and so are themselves truly roseate. Thus, what is revealed by the interpolation of tertiary indigo into the primary, secondary, primary, etc. sequence of the rainbow's colors is that indigo acts as, or stands in for, a secondary color, while violet acts as a primary. However, what is the purpose for this substitution as opposed to that of the most deductive interpolation or removal of green, the central secondary. What can we make of the meaning of this? The third title is Cube. The cube is also an odd man out in its respective number base hierarchy. It was applied by Pythagoreans as the platonic solid corresponding to the element Earth. When one compares the remaining platonic solids and their corresponding elements, however, every single other one has to be rearranged. The dodecahedron of the exoteric cosmos is actually the element occurring first in the base 5 system and represents water, the prime element. Following this, the Greek isosahedron of water is, properly, air, the second element. After this, the Greeks placed the octahedron for air, rightly, of fire. Finally was the tetrahedron of false fire actually an attribute of cosmos, the fifth element of spirit. But the cube remains the same. The reason for this shift in sequence for the dodecahedron, isosahedron, octahedron, and tetrahedron is due to the two different cosmological belief systems of the Greeks and the Hebrews. The Hebrews sequence for the cosmological creation of the four elements was based on concentric spheres, the so-called four worlds model of Kabbalah that were meant to mimic the composition of our planet, Malkuth, with earth final, water above earth, air above water, and fire primary to all, the sun. The Greek version placed fire last in the underworld, or middle earth, below and within earth as the tetrahedron before and beneath the cube. Thus, their cosmology preceded outward from the interior flame, while the Hebrew cosmology inward from the exterior flame. The accurate order of appearance of the four universally elemental forces following the Big Bang places the order as 1. Water, dodecahedron, 2. Air, isosahedron, 3. Fire, octahedron, 4, earth, cube. Again, we see that in all these different orders of various attributes, cosmological elements and platonic solids, only the cube remains constant throughout. In the Greek, Hebrew, and modern cosmologies, the cube stands ubiquitously for the element of earth. Some, in apology for the Greek version of events, compare the cube's shape to the sturdiness of the ground beneath our feet. They say the cube, embedded, cannot be uprooted. It is to the base four geometry of the cube we owe the four elemental forces of material reality, 
expressed as scarlet, gold, citrine, and black in Malkuth, and the four spatial dimensions, including the hyperspatial dimension of time, that govern these forces in material reality. The four worlds of Kabbalah, the Tetragrammaton, and the four standard positions of the line, square, cube, and tesseract, whose shadows are binary, base 4, base 8, and base 16, respectively, all factors of 4, and which are all reducible to the fifth position, the single dimensional point. Thus, all have their counterparts likewise in the base 5 spiritual element, double fire within and without, running and returning, ascending, descending, and all permeating simultaneously, represented by the twin conjoined tetrahedrons of the stella octahedron. So too the interpolation of the mother letter Shin to render the name of Christ from that of God. The fourth title is Strong Nuclear. The modern scientific term for the force related with the cube by the ancient Greeks and with the element Earth by the elder Hebrews is the strong nuclear force. This force is carried on the very stable particles of gluons, mesons, and quarks. The smallest or most fundamental of atomic elements is a nucleus surrounded by a single electron in the form of hydrogen. No atomic nucleus can exist unless infused by at least one electron. If the electron is removed from the hydrogen atom, the nucleus will decompose and the result will be the opposite of the cohesive earth element, the decohesive weak nuclear force of elemental fire. The weak nuclear force is associated with radioactive particle decay and occurs naturally and gradually over time for all atomic nuclei. We use this particle decay of atomic elements to date the formation and history of all forms of once living matter by tracing the decay rate of radiocarbon-14 it emits. The human species, at this point in its evolution, has come to rely heavily on the weak nuclear elemental force of fire, but we know next to nothing about the force of strong nuclear cohesion, the element called earth in the sense of all solid matter. We comprehend that all matter gradually breaks down into energy, but we cannot account for how the matter that does exist came to exist in the first place. And before astronomical odds, the ability of a human mind to account for its own existence as a complex biological being fails. And the ability to explain our own mental existence, let alone shared psychic experiences, is not even yet dreamt of by our logical left brains. Instead, we usually choose to substitute an all-powerful designer with limitless foresight to perfect itself through ourselves in this incarnation. However, the explanation is quite simple and does not require divine design. In places, the universe acts like a closed system, attracting matter inward. In other places, at the same time, the universe acts like an open system recycling the attracted matter into energy by entropy. Instead of accepting the fact that matter is, even still, being compacted out of energy, we marvel at the appearance of something from nothing that we perceive occurring through our minimum light speed barrier veil of C. To us, antimatter is merely quantum particle decay and we have not learned the meaning of all matter is energy to be that some energy is slowed down to below C and that energy we call matter. So long as there remains matter, our universe will continue to exist. 
for when there is no matter to convert into energy, the universe will have dissolved into a nulliverse. At one point, the closed space and open time systems were in exact equilibrium. This was called the point of critical mass. Since that time, there has been more energy than matter overall, more entropy than attraction, and the oldest particles have formed black holes surrounded by galaxies of billions of stars and are gradually destroying them all. It was when the point of critical mass was finally passed ubiquitously throughout the whole universe that the various universal number systems slipped out of place relative to each other. This event was called in Hebrew cosmology the shattering of the clay pots or shells called the cliffoth. It is claimed that before this point of our universe's evolution was past, all was perfect periodicity, all universal cycles regular, and all manifestations perfectly symmetrical. This period is called by the Kabbalists paradise, heaven on earth, and Eden, followed by the fall of man. The fall of the rebel angels from the pure perfection of non-existence into corruptible matter is likewise associated with the original differentiation of the four forces from pure probability, only one Planck time following the Big Bang. This is considered as the first moment of creation of matter, of earth, from which we mankind were made, that is, existence below sea. However, if we look beyond sea as only a minimum speed limit for light, then we will find that before the fall of man at cosmological critical mass and before the fall of angels, one Planck time after the Big Bang, and before even the genesis of something from nothing, there we will find not an insurpassable barrier beyond which is God's business, not man's, guarded by a flaming sword, but only the true light of clear consciousness, pure, unmoved, and unwavering observation, what has long been called heaven of pure spirit and the cosmos of the fifth element. It is not blinding white light, but a clear, invisible glow, a brightness behind, before, and within a darkness. However, it would be out of place for me to speak of this realm any further here, because this exposition deals solely with the slow energy of matter particles attracted into atoms by electron charge and gravity. Cosmologically, it is reckoned that, prior to the genesis of matter from pure energy, only chaos, tohu, and desolation, bohu, existed. And, moreover, it is reckoned from these two God formed our existence. The fifth title is Mercury. While in discussing the four elemental forces and five platonic solids, we had diverged slightly down the scale from the base seven color scheme of the visible light spectrum, now in discussing Mercury, we must return to the base seven system. Before we begin, it should also be noted that this Mercury is the planetary Mercury, and not the alchemical Mercury, and that, by comparison between the planets and alchemical metals, we would indeed find Quicksilver, the equivalent to planetary Mercury, as well as the Pradalyahara, or crown chakra, emanating from the top of the head. So what we are left with in our current context is still to relate the first planet, Mercury, 
to the other attributes under discussion, e.g., the color spectrum, the elements, and the regular solids. As I have already explained, the cube can be related to the elemental force of Earth, the so-called strong nuclear force, and the cube, being unique among five, is therefore alike indigo, the only tertiary color in the spectrum, in that both represent a shifting, or slipping, between the four Hebrew elements and five Greek solids that I will next further discuss relative to the seven colors and seven planets. First, however, Mercury is the name of the Roman anthropomorphic messenger deity. As the Greek Hermes, he was said to have taught alchemy and astrology and been called Trismegistos, thrice greatest. As such, he has been likened also to the Egyptian moon scribe Thoth. What this should show us is how, over time, as an attribute is passed from one culture to another, its meaning changes or shifts, as in this case from Thoth, originally a lunar deity, to the astrological planet Mercury. This should underscore the fact that all pantheist deities are merely an exoteric sleight of hand to misdirect an aspirant's attention away from studying these attributes, not autonomously, but relative to their basic number group. For example, we have already seen what defines indigo as unique in the base 7 color spectrum. Now let us compare the astrological Mercury and some prior cosmological base 7 system. Now, Thoth was revered as a god in Egypt since the times before the flood of Mesopotamia in around 6000 BCE. This means he could be said, by the Greek reckoning, to have been Atlantean, and that, by the Hebrew reckoning, thus related to the pre-Diluvian patriarch Enoch. However, neither of these describe a cosmological principle in a base 7 system, and so we should set these important parallels aside for now. However, according to the 15th century CE magician William Barrett, astrological planet Mercury does relate to an attribute in a base 7 system which, as it turns out, does represent a component in a cosmology, and, it also turns out, the knowledge of this cosmology may be older itself than the Mesopotamian flood of around 6000 BCE. In truth, this other base 7 system, correspondent to the seven astrological planets, may indeed be Atlantean. Consider for a moment the seven Gnostic realities, or powers, of the authorities, or archons. While there was a contemporary zodiac of twelve celestial signs, this alternate base seven system persisted alongside the base twelve system of Gnostic zodiacal aeons, or the fallen archons themselves, including Cain and Abel, along with other unique names. Thus, twelve-month years and seven-day weeks have come down to us as our formal calendar and shared method of measuring lifetimes. Each Gnostic power belonged between both of two archons, the equivalent of this system by the time of Barrett consisted of seven angelic names and their sigils, or signatures. The angelic names are little different from the seven planets, used more as a placeholder. However, the seven sigils, or seals, of the angels given are the more significant point of comparison between these other two 
the seven planets of astrology and seven powers of the archons, according to Gnosticism. In the late 19th century, Egyptologist E. A. Wallace Budge added to these angelic sigils an additional surrounding glyph he called the sigil's position in the zodiac. While also alluding to the layman for arrangement of the base 7 system relative to the base 12, the planets and zodiac, the glyphs themselves, if pieced together in the round, fit into one another to form a distinctly unique shape within which the angelic sigils are then inscribed. The shape formed by the glyphs is that of the folding up around an equiangular spiral of Pythagorean triangles. The Pythagorean theorem triangle has legs of lengths 3 and 4 at right angles, with hypotenuse between them length 5. This triangle is unique since it uses whole numbers to express ratios that occur, for the most part, as fractions and decimal place integers. However, by fixing the expansion rate of the base unit per unfolding triangle in the Pythagorean spiral, we find we can create a scale from the 345 triangle up through a 456 using a different sized base unit, and 567 ad infinitum. It seems the ancients referenced by Budge had also discovered this mnemonic expansion rate and the unique shape that it formed. They had built the shape of seven sizes of square into the places in the zodiac glyphs around the angelic sigils. Each place in the zodiac glyph fits together like puzzle pieces to form the shape of the expanding squares around a spiral of Pythagorean triangles. Now, insofar as we can take the seven puzzle glyphs forming the squares around a triangle spiral by the words of their name, that is, as the place in the zodiac of each angelic sigil, then we can return to the way the seven powers were related to the twelve archons by the Gnostics or Greek Hebrews. The sigil of Mercury's equivalent angel occurs in the upper right place in the zodiac glyph piece of the square spiral layman. However, according to Barrett, the signs of the zodiac ruled over by the planet Mercury are on opposite parts of the circular base 12 zodiac and this attribution by Barrett of signs to planets appears to be an entirely autonomous model apart from the angelic sigils and their place in the zodiac given later by Budge. However, it seems likely the model of seven sigils within the unique square spiral shape being based on Pythagorean mathematics indeed predates Barrett's attributes of two signs per planet. The sixth and seventh titles are Gemini and Virgo. Now, the squares forming the sides of the spiral of Pythagorean triangles have different sized base units from one another, as I'd mentioned, but now we should consider the ratio from one to the next of their rate of expansion. For example, in the case of the square with six units, it adjoins a square of five and of seven as legs on two separate triangles, as well as is opposite a square of seven and a square of eight for these same two triangles hypotenuses. However, so far as the layman of glyphs extends, there is no square of one or two, and the square of ten does not appear, only the seven including three through nine, one being three, and seven being the square of nine. From the Greek system of sigils, magic number squares, gematria and geometry 
called the Camia of the Seven Olympic Dignitaries, described by Henry Cornelius Agrippa in the 16th century CE. We find allusion drawn between Mercury and the eight squared, eight by eight square of 64 base units. This is how, before I could say the sigil of the angel equivalent to Mercury, occupied the position of the zodiac in the upper right corner of the glyph puzzle shape of the square spiral, because that is where the eight squares overlap when the shape is folded into three dimensions. That is why the angelic sigil of the upper right glyph piece is equivalent to Mercury, which is equivalent itself to the eight square of the upper right corner of the unfolding Pythagorean spiral of squares when it remains a graph on a flat plane. Because the squares are comprised of an increasing ratio of size difference for their base units, we can measure this rate of ratio increase easily enough by using the Pythagorean theorem, applying the triangles already present. Because the square leg of one triangle is also the leg of another triangle on the square's adjacent side, and because the equivalent sized squares forming the legs of those two triangles also connect to the same size square on the opposite hypotenuse of yet a third Pythagorean triangle when the model is folded up into three dimensions, then we can easily demonstrate that the expansion rate of base unit size ratios is the golden mean of one to two or two thirds. We can ascertain this by the fact we are using Pythagorean triangles to measure base unit expansion rate and these inherently contain the golden ratio or phi. Thus the spiral of Pythagorean triangles measures phi in two dimensions and thus the squares of these same triangles arranged in their phi ratio of expansion rate are themselves folded and meet in a pi ratio when the shape is bent and turned until it maps into three dimensions. The unique shape of the positions of the zodiac glyph pieces combined as a layman indicates what appears to be a very intricate understanding of very esoteric geometry based on number theory. So the base seven system of camia squares which are synonymous to the base seven places in the zodiac glyphs, which are synonymous to the base seven angelic sigils, which are synonymous to the base seven planets of astrology, is truly an entire complete system of its own, autonomous even of the seven alchemical metals and the seven bodily chakras. It appears that, because of the early dates at which these component materials were all mentioned, because of the Greek and Hebrew Gnostic Apocrypha that substantiates the perpetuation of such base seven systems even earlier on, and because of the indecipherably archaic nature of this particular system, the knowledge of this precise pattern, this unique shape, representing Pythagorean geometry may indeed be ancient in the extreme. The knowledge of such geometry may have even existed more than 8,000 or even 10,000 years ago, long before the destruction by the flood, in the very place and time the Greeks call Atlantis and the Hebrews call Enoch. There is a sufficient amount of evidence to warrant such a conjecture as to say the Pythagorean spiral of squares shape was known of before the flood, simply in the fact alone that the seven planets were attributed one or two each of the signs of the zodiac. In fact, excluding the sun and moon of astrology, the remaining five planets is each ruler over two zodiac signs. 
the sun and moon alone rule over one each. I hope that it is plain to see by now that these five are thus also equivalent to the platonic solids, the four elemental forces, and the seven color spectrum accordingly. The eighth title is Nefesh. In the same manner as the soul is the aura, the spirit hovers over and descends down into the soul and permeates it with calmness and sound reasoning. The spirit is the measurement, phi over pi. The soul, the surface of the torus of the aura, without, and the chakras within, and the body, merely a shell, in which we can hear the sound of ocean waves breathing. Therefore, understand that the Pythagorean order of death recognizes a base five number system for its degrees. However, it should also be seen how the base seven rainbow and base four elements also play in. Our base five system is only one branching pattern, stemming from the fractal spiral growth pattern of primes and other sacred numbers that extends its creeping vines throughout all, forming superstrings of hyperdimension, filaments of galaxies, and nerves of biological cells. Through the phi over pi ratio of space to time, through the phi over pi ratio of matter to energy, and through the phi over pi ratio of our genetic DNA. Neshima is, therefore, a ubiquitous measure, phi over pi, found everywhere, albeit only imperfectly now, post-critical mass, throughout the universe. For there are many souls, each individual, each unique, all imperfect, all aperiodic. Yet there is one spirit, all-inclusive and ubiquitous, perfectly periodic. It is said that this one spirit is God, creator of our material universe. But I will tell you, you can understand the wisdom of this phi over pi geometry without being expected to prove it to disbelievers. You need not usurp the standard of perfection set by God. I will tell you, no phi over pi, but know also that none among us is truly the most high. We are all equal, infinite in potential. Know that we need not worry about whom to follow, nor how best to lead. Know that the phi over pi spiral is the pattern underlying all evolution versus entropy of and in our universe. From before the Big Bang, through the Planck time following it, beyond critical mass to the nulliverse. In the Pythagorean order of death, at the degree of Lodge Grand Master, one learns to see the Neshima, the One Spirit, the pure, invisible, perfect geometry of Phi over Pi everywhere in the universe, occurring simultaneously on all levels of manifestation, by perceiving the indigo cube of Earth, the cameo of Mercury, and angelic sigil, its place in the zodiac of seven, and its rulership over Gemini and Virgo. All these things are hence one in the Neshima, manifesting upon karma in your aura. They shall become you, and you must incorporate them, as they are now affecting you on a purely mental level already. Consider the Neshima, the phi over pi spiral measurement upon the surface of the invisible torus of energy of your aura. It is above all karma, like ink upon paper, like oil upon water, 
like a bird upon air, and it measures all karma perfectly, though what it measures is below it, like blood in a vein, like trees exhaling oxygen, like a fish in the water, and it is imperfect, irregular, intermittent, and sorrowful. Neshima, the spirit, is exalted, high, and divine, clear in visible light. It is the shimmering image of the moon reflected upon waves, and these waves are Nuit, and this moon, Thoth, and this clear invisible light, the true essence of the emanation of Kether, that is, the mind devoid of all thought, clear as crystal, the cleansed aura, Neshima, the spirit, the pattern, Phi over Pi, the yin-yang of karmic chi in the Tao, the measure of each of our auras, our unique field of potential energy, our personal bubble. Yet, though the Neshima is perfect, the soul can never be perfect so long as it is bound to the living flesh. Because the living flesh is entirely the glove, the puppet of the soul. Only when the soul has been stripped free from the body can it, as pure mentation, the mind willing itself into existence, escape painlessly through any wormhole or black hole to explore the cosmology of our reality in order to become more perfect before, more transparent to, the clear light of Neshima and to dissolve itself into Phi over Pi. The lowest portion of the soul is that with which we perceive our own existence, and this was called by the Egyptians the Ka, or energy double, meaning literally shadow. In the Indus Valley, the Vedic priests instructed that this energy shadow, or personal bubble, was rightly called the aura, comprised of chi energy that surrounds a person in the form of binary, good or bad, choices called karma, and that interacts with the person in their seven chakras, nerve centers called ganglii or plexuses, occurring along the spine. Below the divine, perfect measurement of phi over pi, the eternal geometry of the Neshima, the one spirit of all material existence, is the imperfect, aperiodic soul, the aura and chakras of the individual. In the highest of the four worlds of Kabbalah, there is the one spirit. In the next lower are the many souls. Below that, the many bodies. The lowest world is the single body, and within it, a single soul that, by ascension, connects in turn directly to the single spirit. Thus, the body, the biological form containing the nerves, the nerves, cells of DNA, the DNA of molecules, the molecules, atoms, atoms, quanta, we initiates call the nefesh, the substance of our bodies, that is, containing all lesser layers or levels of matter, and these extrapolable to all material reality, is thus a glove worn by the mental existence that is self-perceiving. Like a man floating out very deep in the ocean, the portion above the surface of quantum foam is the self-aware existence of the psyche, while that below the surface of the space-time continuum is sunk into, entrenched, drowning in a quagmire of the merely material and purely physical existence, and, like a man floating in deep water, the portion below depends on that above to survive. There are inert masses in matter, but those of us possessed of sentience 
are capable of self-motivating function. We are thus beings from this higher level, merely floating in the depths of this incarnate lifetime. Thus, even the lowest part of the soul, the aura and chakras perceiving themselves as the mind, is in direct contact above to the Neshima, Phi over Pi, the omniversal Unis spirit, and below to the Nefesh, the exclusively existent yet inanimate and unliving base matter of our physical composition. The Neshima descends down into the Nefesh in the form of the aura and the seven chakras, just as does the mind inhabit and fill up the body. Yet all within and without the barrier of our biological influence and all existence beneath see the surface of the quantum continuum are the same substance, and this stuff the vibrational dimension of solid energy, is the nefesh. As I have said, so long as the mind is bound to the body, the mind is not at utter liberty to come unstuck from the physical plane. Though we can imagine beyond C, well enough to make accurate geometric calculations, and by doing so demonstrate our mental capability to take such a quantum leap necessary to cross the threshold of a black hole or travel through a wormhole, although we can accomplish these feats mentally while alive, we will only be experiencing the events we observe mentally, at will, and as if in a dream, and can just as easily snap back to our ordinary physical existence as living biological organisms. Thus, it is only after the death of our flesh vessel that the mind can truly become detached from the physical body and thus fully experience the potential events occurring in both our own physical as well as the metaphysical realms which we can now only imagine. While we are alive, we can predict exactly what traveling through a wormhole from one point in space to another would be like. Only after our death as physical beings will we be able to truly experience it. So it is also with the realms above and beyond sea, the space-time surface of our quantum continuum. And remember that, like a man at sea, we are from land, and by walking up the shore and onto it, we arise from out of this universe to return to worlds entirely beyond it. The realms we imagine now in our minds are the vistas of the spiritual realms beyond material reality. This concludes my knowledge lecture on the titles of Three Degree Essene Zealot. Here is a knowledge lecture for the various titles of the Knight Zion of the Pythagorean Order of Death, also called a Grand Inspector General and Ambassador of the Order of Death. The first title is Ambassador. It is all well and good to attend a lecture at a university. In addition, it is good that a reading assignment should accompany the lecture. In truth, it is even fair to assign questions for the reading as homework. This can also compose only a portion of the overall grades given to each student by their group's single teacher. But if one limits the grades based on reading questions beneath the emphasis placed on rote memorization, one will only benefit the cheats and punish the poor rather than creating a truly standardized testing environment. 
This has taken us since 300 BCE to rediscover, and we are still learning it now. Primary emphasis must be placed on logical, short-term comprehension, or by limiting the emphasis to rote memorization in the shorter term of the single testing period, we will achieve no longer term roots for our educational goals, whatever those be, than to trigger creative, cornered, and criminal behavior, and instead of training long-term skills, only inculcate short-term predatory instincts. If we grade students based more on quiz skills than on homework reading, we are encouraging irresponsibility over the long-term periods between tests and the false ethic of cramming one's entire course of study into a single night immediately prior to the testing period. Ultimately, this distorts the value of education in favor of the momentarily resourceful and those who enable themselves and others to plan and even bank bets on the justification for the consistency of their own laziness. If all educators were on the same page of their textbooks, rather than their meager ledgers, for even a single moment, about this banking of bets on enabling liars and thieves in the moment, resulting in the long term in evolutionary retardation, then all would rightly agree in the best interest of their students, the future, and the species, that to prolong our oppression by capital to such banking of bets, we enable only our own self-destruction, and agree, therefore, on the opposite of this, to encourage longer-term responsibility by grading more over time on reading interpretation and less on controlled environment testing, must be the lesser evil and in the greater good of all. Just as it is the rule of large grand masters to attend thus to their students, so too is it the regulation of lodge ambassadors who travel from lodge to lodge to look upon the grand master of each lodge as does a teacher their students. The ambassador governs over the grand masters just as each grand master presides over their lodge. Therefore we must encourage the same values in each equally to all and seek to make these values those of what is good for our students, the future, and our species. The role of the lodge ambassador is between that of being a grand master over an individual lodge and being a traveling Rosicrucian who belong to no local lodge. As ambassadors we go between the various clutches of Illuminati and Bohemian camps the district and area directors, to represent them to the individual lodges, grand masters, and other individual members of their respective parties, ranks, or groups affiliation, and to represent these constituents' interests to their various roles, counterparts, chief offices in the clutches and camps. Therefore, we must remember to remain thus carefully balanced. On the one side, we represent the will and interests of each lodge member of each lodge we have visited. On the other side, we represent the will and interests of their different offices' headquarters, the various organizations being equivalent to the different stations in the lodge. In the Pythagorean order of death, Five members are required for an initiation ritual of the third degree. Two persons, one voice, one guide, and the candidate. Therefore, five standing positions are given to the celebrants of a lodge of five masters. Grand Master, Ambassador, Regional, District, and Area Directors. 
These are equivalent to the five party office orders within the order of death. York and Scottish Masons, Rosicrucians, Illuminati, and OTO. Just as within each order there are degrees equivalent to each of the other orders, so within each lodge there are stations for each party affiliate representative officer. All of these are five within the order of death. Just as the order of death can be called the way of the hand, so must we think of the ambassador as like the thumb. The five members of a master lodge send out one from among them. The ambassador is therefore also called the adversary and acts as lodge judge, though they are interchangeable from lodge to lodge. The primary oath of loyalty of the lodge judge is to the order as a whole, above the oaths sworn by any lodge officer or order member to their station or their order. This is why we are called Knights Templar of the Order of Zion, because we guard the temple of Mount Zion, housing the sacred covenant ark. We cherish in our hearts above all the value of the entire senate of four lodges combined with three wandering Rosicrucians, that is, the five members per lodge, and the three public officers. Mount Zion is the order of twenty-three, but the tabernacle is each of the twenty-three stationed officers. To convene, the Senate requires four lodges, each with fifteen members, one senator with two guards or alternates for each of the five regular stations. The total number of order members necessary to convene the Senate is, thus, 63. However, the minimum necessary to operate a rough Senate are four senators, each with two alternates who stand behind them as guards, thus only 12. These numbers convene an open base 5 Senate, however variations also include open and closed base systems for any other number combination of lodge, order, member representatives as well. The order of death, however, will only be applied to the open base 5 Senate of between 12 and 63 members. However, to convene a Senate, there are not only requisites for qualification by each member. There are also many other options open to any member than to preside in the Atlantean Senate of the Order of Death. Therefore, besides choosing to acquire or to stop at any level of the lodges and the orders, a member of the Order of Death advanced in either can then attain to either the church or state offices within the order of death. Just as the Atlantean Senate houses all the political decisions in the moment, so does the Lemurian Temple teach openly the secrets of the ancient past. The order of death is both these things, as well as a pope between them, and thus stands everywhere for twenty-three. The second title is Orange. The ancients chose wisely in the separation of church and state. Consider that the three blue degrees lead either into Scottish Rite or York Rite masonry. In the order of death, the York Rite order, following the blue lodge degrees, is attributed the color indigo, and our Scottish Rite equivalent is attributed the color orange. 
these colors being opposite one another on the color spectrum divide from the three blue lodge degrees that form the roots of the order and the state senate and templar church that are the red leaves leaving between them the other five colors of the spectrum as the trunk however the remaining five colors of the spectrum do not simply occupy their ordinary positions in the rainbow sequence rather the highest rank is green the middle color while we are told that orange and indigo are of equal rank, as are the York and Scottish rites of masonry. This is because the order of the colors per order of the order of death proceeds as upon an arch. Violet and red represent the opposite two supporting columns. On one side, the three degrees of each lodge and on the other the three branches or ranks of the church and state structure of the upper order of death. The capstone is green because green is also attributed to the chronologically supernal order of the order of death bund. Above the column of red occurs the color stone orange, the Scottish rite and above the column of violet occurs the color stone indigo, the York right degree of the order of death. Thus, the Rosicrucians and Illuminati orders are also equal and opposite immediately beneath the OTO degree. The OTO degree is invested with power in both the church and state as well as in each individual lodge. Thus, the OTO of the senators is the chair, and thus there are five OTO members per each 15-member proper lodge, or three per 15-member papal consulate. And thus, the OTO is also equivalent to the area representative in each lodge acting as the right hand of the Lodge Grand Master. While we, ambassadors, operate second from the Grand Master's left. To their immediate left is the Regal Rosicrucian, and to their far right sits the Lodge Illuminatus. Altogether, the five members of a Lodge of Masters preside as a bench in the Senate as well as a board overseeing the lesser initiates of each lodge. Those who so choose may be m mentored for a specific post, but other new initiates may be raised by the bench. When this is done, the five masters of the lodge will have all voted on it, but it may be done for whole classes of initiates simultaneously. Also, members of the bench can serve as alternates or doubles in the Senate. However, this authority, among other representative intra-lodge, to promote candidates they choose does not extend to the powers of the Church, the State, nor the Pope of the Order. Because the number of members of a bench lodge and the minimum number of members requisite to form a church are the same, both are five, we see that once a lodge is established, by adding one member as an elected priest, they may immediately begin operating Lemurian religion. Likewise, because the number of members per senatorial lodge, 15, is also that, including the Pope, of a papal consulate, also called a royal courtere or court, then once any lodge becomes established enough to operate as one-fourth of a base five senate, it will have reached the same status and rank as a monastery that had grown to the same number membership who could then nominate from among them or have nominated if necessary 
a candidate for Pope of the Order of Death. In this way, we see the politics and religion of the Order of Death are the same. We learn in our Lodge degrees as the sacred groups by numbers. We learn that one, Imhotep, needs a second, Nyarlahotep, to accomplish the work of three, the three kings. We learn of the base four tetragrammaton supremacy to the three degrees, those lesser elements forming earth, and even hint at the base five Christ consciousness of spirit, the greatest elements surrounding them all. So, in the Knights Templar degree, we have begun to discuss the base seven rainbow arrangement. However, mostly thus far, we have described only the five lodge members, orders of the order of death. We may see by now that the structure of the order of death, the three degree lodges, the five orders, and the two branches of church and state does correspond roughly to the three blue the philosophical, the chivalric, and the executive degrees of Scottish Rite Masonry, just as the philosophical degrees of the Scottish Rite can be classed as Rosicrucian, and the chivalric alike the York Templar orders, so does the Order of Death recognize Rosicrucian and Illuminati orders as equally as it does the York and Scottish Rites as the philosophical and chivalric equivalents to one another as well. And all these, above the twin pillars of Lodge and Church or State, are below the all-seeing OTO area director. The product of the three degrees are the five orders, corresponding to the five Lodge offices. The two positions, state or church, then become available for the five members to operate, six equaling church and seven equaling an executive committee. Just as the Scottish Rite Templar Knight occupies one position in five within the lodge, so too does this rank equal one specific role in the senate or guard and so too does the Scottish Templar Knight function relative to the Church, though not as priest slash Grand Master, instead like a Lodge Ambassador or Envoy from Church to Church and from their own Church to others' Lodges. By adding a Sixth Master, a Lodge is raised to a Church. The GM becomes the OTO, the other five become three Rosicrucians and two Illuminati. By adding a seventh member, a church can be raised again or hired as an executive council of seven. The seventh member added becomes Scottish Rite and assumes the same role among the other six as would the fifteenth member of a more prominent lodge. All are then styled as three Rosicrucians of the 2C degree. Two, 2B degree Illuminati, and one, 2A degree OTO, formerly the York GM. Thus we see our ambassadors orange in the five, the seven, the fifteen, etc. of the state, but not in the six or the ten or the fourteen of the church. This is in keeping with our rank in our original base five respective lodge. Just as there are five lodge members, one of whom is a visiting ambassador, so too does an ambassador circulate between four lodges and thus tie together into the region of a single Rosicrucian. The Rosicrucian answers to the Illuminati District Director, who in turn answers to the OTO Area Director. Thus, five times four plus three 
equals 23. The third title is Octahedron. Ancient Greek philosophers associated the octahedron with the force of air. In the order of death, we associate it with the force of fire. We know the force of fire as the weak nuclear force present throughout the universe. We know this force occurred third in the appearance of forces following the Big Bang. Moreover, we know the attribution by the Greeks to have followed knowledge of the proper technique, placing the octahedron equivalent to fire or the weak nuclear force, because its displacement forms a specific sequence that implies direct intent. The Greek version arose to occlude and cover up the true attributions, which were considered too dangerous to be understood for having caused the Atlantean flood. This, of course, is only superstition. The order of death retains the true attribution of the octahedron to the force of fire. All of this is known to every member of the order of death. Each lodge member of five represents one of five orders, and if there are sufficient numbers of members these can pass through various states and stages, a lodge of five, a church of six, executive committee of seven, monastery of ten, court of thirteen, papal court of fifteen, or senate of twenty, twenty-three, sixty-three, or even of only twelve. Ideally, each member should understand the hierarchy of the order of death as well as they do the relationship between the four elements learned in the three degrees of lodge and the five solids learned in the branch office orders. However, they cannot, because the full extent of the knowledge concentrating on this matter is focused in this degree, that of lodge ambassador, because we serve as the judge or adversary in a lodge court. We are considered impartial on account of being foreign to the lodge, but after only a few circuits this ceases to be the case. Therefore we study the laws and bylaws while the other lodge members order representatives learn about the reason that the Knights Templar Order of Zion Scottish Rite Masonry is associated with an orange octahedron. Ask them and approach them, that they may also inquire to you about the law and the knowledge held exclusively by our station as ambassadors. Therefore, leave off the philosophical matters of the Rosicrucians, the Illuminati, or Golden Dawn, and of the York Rite of Masonry. Devote yourself instead to unraveling the mysteries shared by the ambassador and the area directors, or between the Scottish Rite and OTO. Just as the Rosicrucian sits just right of the Grand Master in the Lodge, colluding to the far-right Illuminati, so too between the OTO to the GM's immediate left and the far-left Scottish ambassador. Thus they are all on the bench, the Rosicrucians and the Illuminati to the left, and the OTO and Scottish right to the right of the York GM. So they sit in Lodge. But when they sit in Senate, they keep order relative to the position of the chair, wherein is seated the OTO area director. The ordering issues out from the chair towards either the chair's left or right, depending on their lodge's station in the four lodge senate. Thence, the York GM, the Illuminati, the Rosicrucian, and the Scottish Rite. The Scottish and York face away from the chairs while the Rosicrucian and Illuminati sit facing inward on the proceedings, 
In the Senate, it is the Rosicrucian and Illuminati who act as ambassadors or consuls, while the York and Scottish guard doors and windows. However, in each lodge, the Illuminati reports to the Rosicrucian, the Scott ambassador reports to the OTO, who reports to the Lodge GM, the York Rite, along with the Rosicrucian. The Rosicrucian brings the news from the Illuminati, internal lodge intelligence, and the OTO brings the word from the ambassador, external lodge intelligence. That is why the OTO is Senate Chair and not the York GM as in Lodge. The OTO's loyalty is to the Senate, that of the York to their Lodge. The loyalty oath sworn by the ambassadors is, as stated before, to balance on the one hand the good of the four lodges in their circuit, and on the other the offices of order above themselves, the Rosicrucians, the Illuminati, and the OTO. We call the combination of the Senate circuit of traveling lodges and the three positions per lodge represented by higher order offices, the order of death. Together these are four times five plus three equals twenty-three. The fourth title is Weak Nuclear. Just as the orange octahedron represents fire, the weak nuclear force, in the order of death, so too are the five orders officers per lodge, and so are the four or five lodges of an open or closed senate. When the senate is open, The fifth lodge, comprised entirely of OTOs, is represented only as the three public senators, one of whom is Pope. So, in an open base 5 senate, as in a closed base 4 senate, there are lodges that can each represent the four orders below the OTO area director. So, in a closed Base 5 Senate, would there be 25 members, including a lodge of five OTO area directors? Just as four regional Rosicrucians, four district Illuminati, four York and four Scottish Rite each preside under four OTO chairs in the open Base 4 or 5 Senate, So, in a closed base four or five senate, each lodge represents only the members belonging to an order's equivalent station, position, role, or office in the lodge. Thus, in an open senate, you would have a Templar knight on each lodge bench, but in a closed senate, you would have four or five representatives, one from each lodge, all sitting on one bench per order of the order of death. This is why a lodge of five masters is considered perfect or closed. The bench of five members, each equal, is equivalent to a bench of five senators in either a closed or open council. If there are six, the lodge is a church, and if there are four, the lodge itself is considered rough or open. Perfect or closed democracy occurs along the system of primes 3, 5, 7, 13, 23, etc. are the integers at the foundation of Atlantean democracy. However, the order of death recognizes the existence of other forms of senate closed or open, based on other unfolding number sequences. We do not recognize separate senates acting simultaneously. We only use one senate in different configurations at different times. The reason to rotate the highest ranked position 
between GM in Lodge to OTO Chair in Senate is the same reason to hold both open and closed sessions, each meeting of its own unique combination of members between the Lodges as the Orders. It is because of checks and balances of power within the political system. It is so one Order's representatives per Lodge will not attempt to assassinate another if they sit next to each other. This is the same reason there are 60 Lodge members in the full and proper Senate, 15 per Lodge, 3 alternates per station. It is so the democracy will not falter for even an instant, even should the Pope themselves die. However, should the OTO chairs seek to betray their Lodge GM, we have made them sit apart from one another. And so, if the Rosicrucians or Illuminati attempt to kill the OTO chair, the York and Scottish are there to retain them. Should the York and Scottish rites likewise seek to betray the Rosicrucians and Illuminati, or the OTO, then one can rush to the defense of the other. This is why, from time to time, we must hold closed-door sessions of the Senate, to root out any traitors in our midst, such as during a trial of thirteen, or a papal court of fifteen plus seven plus one equals twenty-three, the closed base four and closed base five versions, respectively. What is the punishment for one senator murdering another? If a senator kills a senator, then the senator who killed is also murdered by the first alternate of their victim in their enemy's lodge. What is the punishment for a guard murdering a guard? If a guard should murder a guard, may the guard who killed be also murdered by the second guard of the victim's lodge. What is the punishment for a senator murdering a guard? If a senator kills a guard, let the senator be replaced by their own next alternate. What is the punishment for a guard murdering a senator? If a guard kills a senator, let that guard be either poisoned or forced to commit suicide. In all instances, the deceased are immediately replaced by their next alternate of three. Thus, if both their guards are killed, a senator must step down from the bench and act as a guard themselves. These are the laws of the Senate, bylaws of the order of death, that not all the alternates, or even your equivalent or higher degree masters of orders, nor even any initiate below master, 2C degree, may know. Only the OTO chairs and the Scottish Rite may know the full extent of these laws, and thus they sit to the right of the York GM in a bench lodge. This is why the Scottish Rite sits closest behind the OTO chair in the Senate. All of this may seem confusing still at this point. However, it is as easy to remember as one, two, three when you see the equivalencies across the board. The York Rite Lodge GMs, the Indigo Cube, the Church of the Temple, the Scottish Rite Lodge Ambassadors, the Orange Octahedron, the Executive Committee, the Rosicrucian Regional Directors, the Blue Isosahedron, the Monastery of Ten, the Illuminati District Directors, the yellow dodecahedron, the jury of thirteen, the OTO chairs of foreign intelligence, the green tetrahedron, the papal court of fifteen, and so the senate between twelve and sixty-three. In the open, base five senate, the perfect democratic number, the ideal of twenty-three active members becomes possible. Likewise, in a closed base four. The fifth title is Venus. 
So far, we have discussed the base 4 and base 5 systems, open, base 19, and base 23, respectively, and closed, base 12, and base 75 systems accordingly. But I have not yet described the role of the Scottish Rite Templar Knight of the Order of Zion as it relates to the other ranks and groups in which it is contained. Let us now ask, what is the role of this position in the group of executives, or that of a papal jury, or that of a bench of Rosicrucian regional directors in a closed senate? This is not because an ambassador cannot serve as an executive, one of seven, or in a papal court, of fifteen, or even on a bench of Rosicrucians, four or five, in a closed session. But if you are acting as the Scottish Rite Ambassador within a group, four or five, open or closed, that has a fixed role for that position, and your group added or subtracted any amount of members to fall into a different group number base, then the title of the omitted role such as ambassador from a bench of Rosicrucians, is changed accordingly to those applicable to all for the new group number base. Such a change cannot be made by only a single group member, but is dependent entirely on the number of members in the group. So, for example, if a lodge of five became a church of six, it would mean the Scottish Rite Knight Zion position, would become automatic members of the Rosicrucian rank of regional director, one of three. Likewise, at such time, if there were two OTO chairs in the five master lodge, upon becoming a church, by adding the second OTO, then one of these two would need to step down or assume a lesser rank, such as Illuminati district director, one of two, and thus so forth displace the other possible ranks among members accordingly. Some levels the Scottish Rite has specific roles in, others not. However, even when not in active office, a Rosicrucian representative remains a Rosicrucian representative, etc. For the Scottish Rite, it is the same, although for the traveling ambassadors, there are far fewer roles for us by title than even the Rosicrucians, only one degree above us. The reason for this is that, due to our extensive knowledge of Senate law, we are excluded, for the most part, from religious offices with titles. Likewise, we play a tertiary role in the Lodge, equivalent to a circuit judge, and only a minor role in the Senate, one senator and two alternates as their guards at most. Why is this? The reason for this pertains to the Grand Cross Alignment of 2000 CE and the end of the Mayan Pictun in 2012 CE. Just as the York GMs are ascribed to the Essene Zealot movement of 2000 years ago, so is the Scottish ambassador, associated with the Crusade era, Knights Templar. Likewise, they were chronologically followed during the Renaissance by Rosicrucian regional directors. In 1776, the Illuminati of district directors was founded. By now, around 2000 CE, we have the OTO cult of Bohemian Grove, representing the area chairs in the Pentad Senate. In the future, however, the Pentad Senate will remain, however each attribute will slide down one slot to make room for a new world order to follow the 20th century Oriental Templars. Though, should the eldest club yet remain prominent, such that for some time following the future new world order, the Essene zealot tradition were to continue, then the Senate would change from base 5 to base 6 and all relative elements, lodge members, orders in the Bund, 
as well as color and solid shape attributes would be rearranged accordingly. We say at times the Senate is open or closed and that it can be base four, five, or even six. The Senate is the overall number base system for the entire order of death and it can completely change number of members over time. Such possible changes are called the seasons of the Pope. Sometimes we say thus, a Pope is of a more democratic mind. They will convene the open base five Senate of 23. Say though, a Pope is more despotic. Then membership can drop as low as even only one or two or even version to 63, all possible number-based systems are recognized by the order of death. The sixth and seventh titles are Taurus and Libra. The other members of a lodge remain in their local lodge. So too are the Tyler, York, other bench senators, an OTO chair, stationary in their positions. But the ambassador travels from lodge to lodge. Once they have completed a circuit comprised of four or more separate lodges, they advance to become the next alternate roll up, that of one in three Rosicrucians of a church of six, that of one in seven executives, any is equally likely of being the Pope, etc. Just as the six-member church is equivalent to the York GM order, so is that of the seven executives alike the Scottish Rite Knight Templar Order Zion, and the Monastery of Ten, like the Rosicrucian Regional Order, the jury like the Illuminati, and papal court like the OTO. Now, just as titles can be shifted to promote or demote a member in rank, even while they hold equivalent offices and perform identical duties, such that the various titles, dependent on the size of the group, are all relative in meaning only. So too do the number of senators present vary, and this determines the kind of hearings that can preside. Just as if thirteen senators preside in a closed jury, so too can four or five meet as a rough senate, or clandestine coven, a clutch of Illuminati, a rough lodge, etc. The different number of members present determines the type of proceedings, but all are of at least one degree in the order of death. All of these things must be known, worked out, and ultimately understood by any lodge ambassador or representative of the Templar order in the order of death. We must study together with one another as much as possible and develop affiliations with others of our own status as travelers as much as possible. We must uphold the values of, above all, the order. We must maintain communications between the wandering Rosicrucians and the York Lodge GM. We must commune directly with the chairs over areas called camps. All of these things, as ambassadors, we must do. Our roles in Lodge and Senate are more significant than in the more religious, esoteric orders, and we are like the seven political executives by our studies. Then, while York GMs are closer to the church of six and the Rosicrucians above us like a monastery of ten. All these things must be known, yet I warn you. Though this role will always be needed, that of court stenographer, essentially, the political party occupying this role will not always remain the same. Once the Essene zealots held this office, one day shall it be held by the Rosicrucians, and, in turn, the Illuminati, and the OTO, and even the New World Order to follow that. 
Let us rejoice now that this position is held by the illustrious Knights Templar of the Order of Zion. Let us pray they serve in it well. The eighth title is Ruach. One more esoteric point remains, however. The Ruach is divided into two parts, the Ka, or Aura, and the Ba, or more appropriately, the seven Bay of Ra, the seven chakras. The seven chakras align to connect the soul to the spirit, the Ahak, which exists directly above and infuses the body, or the Ka. Just as the Kaha is the Nefesh, the Ka and the Bay are the Ruach, and the Ak, the Neshima. Someday you may overhear your brothers discussing such a thing and wonder at it among one another. Perhaps even apart from you and your fellow ambassadors, they will whisper that one kind of seven is like many other kinds of seven. Yet there are also some kinds of seven that are different than other kinds of seven, and they will fall into confusion. The seven lower sephirot and the seven number squares of the Pythagorean phi ratio spiral may be like both the seven planets that crossed in their alignment in 2000 CE and the seven chakras, the Bay of Ra. But these other two, the planets and chakras are not alike one another. They will decry and then shake their heads and lower their faces. But I will tell you this right now. The times of the Pope being of the Templar order come and come again. Just as once the Templars were the chairs, now held by the OTO, so too may we yet regain rulership over the Senate by our achievement of the elected position of Pope, so long as we retain rank and order. The symbol of two knights riding back to back on a horse is a symbol of the order of death as the order of Zion, and of the Templars as historians of the perfect democracy. They ride from right to left, or from both east to west, facing north, and west to east, facing south, both, just as one knight faces front and one knight faces back. The fact this emblem was emblazoned onto coins, or tokens representing exchange value by weight of pure substance, indicates the supremacy of the Templar's skills in bookkeeping, the highest form of the library sciences. But we are not ambitious for greater authority or to change ranks and group number base. We are wary of the use of our faith against us by prior popes, both exoteric, Catholic, and esoteric order of death popes, and of death by torture in accordance with excommunication. But we do not seek power. We are balancers of justice. We lodge ambassadors. In Atlantis, these rules and roles were known, and our order bears witness and testimony to this ancient knowledge in our modern works at its restoration. Therefore, act to bring your brothers in their various different branches together, and never go on long watching them bicker in discontent. Instead, show them these letters of the law, L, 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 that they may know you speak truth, then teach them, go between them and teach. This concludes the knowledge lecture of the titles of Four Degree Knight Zion. Here is my knowledge lecture on the meaning of the titles of Five Degree Regal Rosicrucians. The first title is Regional. 
This refers to the rank and file that the Rosicrucians are those representing a region within a larger hierarchy. The titles for such a position are plural in the extreme, and none others need be mentioned here. Think of the regions on a map of the Earth. Now think of these moving as the Earth rotates around its axis, exchanging day for night relative to which side of the Earth is facing the Sun. Now think of these moving as the Earth revolves around the Sun, and observe how this divides the days and nights into the different degrees of the four seasons. Now see that the different regions of Earth develop warm climates over time due to the length of the days they face the sun in warm seasons, when Earth and the sun are near. Now see that the different regions of Earth become cold from facing away from the sun for longer durations. But look, there is more. See how, just as these regions of Earth are subject to hot and cold climates for different periods over the ages, so too do the magnetic poles of Earth occasionally reverse the direction of their charge. This is because none of these periods is exactly equal. None of the orbits are regular, all are oblate or elliptical, obliquely angled to one another. None of the rotations are perfectly circumferential of a single polar region because the axis wobbles, which also causes the electromagnetic poles to reverse at certain times, which happens when the geographic and electromagnetic poles coincide and overlap. All of this happens with aperiodicity in location, duration, etc meaning that the planet Earth is never in the same exact location when the periods of ages, seasons of climates, and features of regions are all one way as it was the last time they were, and it never twice has the exact same climate and regions for the same amount of time. However, the regions the Rosicrucians really govern over are perfectly periodic. There will, they calculate, come a time when all of these events overlap and occur together, when there is the first noticeable change in the climates we humans have celebrated holidays. We therefore venerate the transitional periods between climatological plateaus. These themselves calculate the Rosicrucians, gradually pass through dual phases, like night and day. One of these phases, night for day, is when all the orbits, rotations, and poles are wobbling, alternating, and aperiodic. The other, day for night, is when all the orbits, rotations, and poles are straight and equal and even. At least, so calculate the Rosicrucians. This is the meaning of the true rose, for just as the false or fallen rose signifies to the common mind the cross, so too does the cross in the mind of the enlightened conjure up the idea of a rose. This means that, as we have raised up the minds of men since the early Renaissance, the five-petaled rose has been associated in the mind with the thorns of that vine. Just as the crown of thorns was placed upon the head of Christ to mark, that is, to stain or taint the majesty of his blood, red as a rose, so, too, when a true Rosicrucian sees a rose by any other name, he will only see a remarkable pattern, and this pattern is exemplified by the grand cross of the planets in the zodiac. The Grand Cross occurs when any number of the terrestrial planets align with any number of the Jovian planets at the same time as they both align with Earth. There are any number of incredibly complex geometric variations on these parameters, of course. 
However, all we need to know in order to be able to make calculations, that is, predictions, about future climate changes in our various regions is what exact alignment and of how many planets we are closest to, which, that is, has happened most recently, or is about to happen next. For example, a grand cross alignment of Earth with the seven planets known to the ancient alchemists as metals occurred on May the 5th, Gregorian calendar year 2000. Because the event itself occurred on a specific date, that is, within the year 2000, on an anciently reckoned calendar, tends to indicate that such events occur cyclically. Thus, there is some form of harmony that was perceived by those calculating our current calendar with the Grand Cross alignment, and possibly among many, many others. However, let us pause for only this moment to consider the Grand Cross alignment of 5-5-2000 of the seven alchemical planets. This is the Rosy Cross. The rose of seven petals, that is, the true rose, is the planets in the alignment of their orbits, and the true cross is the alignment of their orbits itself. However, the true rose cross is even more than this, infinitely more. For consider the strange twisting into three dimensions of the Pythagorean arrangement of seven, or for that matter five, number squares, and you will behold how the cross becomes the rose over time. Now it is obvious that the Pythagorean arrangement of magic number squares will fold up regardless of whether it includes seven, five, or any number of squares. The use of seven in specific, and related by alchemists to the metals, and by astrologers to planets, refers directly to the Grand Cross of seven planets that occurred on May 5th, 2000. So we say that this seven-planet Grand Cross must have occurred before, and it must have occurred a duration previous and a duration hence from now that, while not equal, are harmonious, and while not precisely periodic, are calculable. In this way, learn that the seven planets associated by the ancient alchemists with metals does not mean these seven were the only planets known to ancient astronomers, any more than these seven were the only metals known to ancient metallurgists. These were, however, chosen by the cult of alchemists among the metallurgists and by the cult of astrologers among the astronomers as being significant of something else that is, referring to something greater. The greater thing that these seven refer to is the alignment of the same seven heavenly spheres on May 5th, 2000 AD. The alchemists and the astrologers recognize the significance of periodicity in time. The astrologers sought to predict events based on the positions of the planets in the heavens. The alchemists sought to find a way of ingesting superconductive metal that would result in immortality. These both reflect that the alchemists and the astrologers contemplated time as it was made manifest in the combinations of patterns that comprise natural phenomena. In other words, their studies as metallurgists and astronomers had led them to discover the inherent periodicity that underlies the seeming aperiodicity of cyclical events. In still other words, they rediscovered for us all, by each discovering for themselves, that by comparing objects in nature one can see the repetition of events over time. In the simplest words possible, if you want to make a model of the planetary alignments, all you need to use are different colored stones. The second title is Blue. This is the meaning of the blue rose. 
The rose is red because it is reflecting electrons of the wavelength our intraocular cones register as red. The red shift of the galaxies is a similar effect, and it is how we know that space-time is expanding as all the visible galaxies in the universe appear to be moving away from us and one another, thus portraying a red shift to their spectral emissions as the wavelengths are elongated due to the Doppler effect on rays of photon radiation. Basically, red photon radiation has longer wavelengths than, say, blue photon radiation. Now, in the same way that different stars appear different colors as they age through and around the main sequence, because of the content of their gas vacuumed in and ignited by the star's initial nova, so too do galaxies appear red-shifted, not because space-time in between galaxies is increasing. It is that the space-time interior to the galaxies is decreasing. All formed galaxies have black holes in them. Spiral galaxies have one at the center. These black holes are vacuuming in space-time within the galaxies towards their center. However, the depth of a black hole is thought to be capable of tunneling to nearly the beginning of space-time, when the forces split following the Big Bang. Therefore, when we look through our telescopes into the deep field of the filaments, walls, and voids of our local universe, galaxies appear red-shifted, because the galaxies are being consumed into themselves. This causes the optical illusion of the space between them increasing. So it is, too, with the rose. It absorbs every color of the spectral wavelengths of photon light, however red it reflects. This means that the rose is literally the opposite color of the light that is bouncing off it. It is, in essence, every color other than the one it appears to be. However, to depict a rose of every color other than red by mixing pigments is impossible. Therefore, we say, in essence, because we mean electromagnetically, and by electromagnetically, we mean by making use of photon light. Therefore, to depict a rose of every color other than red, we use the shorthand of a blue rose, because blue is the exact inversion of red on the color spectrum. The reason for wanting to depict a blue rose is to see the false or fallen rose as it truly is. Why is blood red? It is because of the pigmentation hues of our platelet cells inside our plasma. However, were we to see this color as it truly is, it would be blue. This is the way it appears through our semi-translucent epidermis while it still flows inside the capillaries, veins, and arteries beneath. The vein beneath the skin looks blue. This is because no light is reaching the blood directly. Therefore, it is reflecting the opposite color wavelength of photon radiation than if it were exposed to light. It is like seeing a silhouette through paper. The paper is white and the light is white, but the shadow is black. This is because the light can slightly permeate the paper, but it cannot pass through the object casting the shadow. This is why the paper is white with light, but the object behind it is dark. It is dark because it has mass. In the same way, blood inside the vein looks the opposite color as it does outside the vein. Some would say that the blood of anemics and other rarities of blood type comprise the blue blood de facto royal families of the super wealthy among the power elites. This, of course, is not true, for we see one generation thrust up by no greater factors than dumb luck only for their third or fifth or even seventh generation to lose this fortune to chance fate. We would not see otherwise random occurrences such as these were the randomly wealthy by blood descended exclusively from, say, ancient pharaohs of Egypt, ancient Roman emperors, etc. 
Those who subscribe to this form of pseudoscience trace the lineage of the blue bloods back to the Rh negative plasma that lacks the gene of the rhesus monkey. Rhesus monkeys are from Indonesia and have been found at one time or another across Oceania from Australia to New Zealand to the Indian subcontinent. Most of humanity, eugenicists claim, descended from rhesus monkeys. The blue bloods, however, they claim, are a rare strand of human that did not evolve from the rhesus monkey. However, when asked to back these very scientific-sounding claims up using further scientific evidence, the eugenicists cannot, and so resort to vague quotes from early Hebrew scripture. Instead, the scientific fact of the Rh-negative blue bloods is that they do possess the potential genetic combination recognized as the rhesus monkey gene. However, it is scrambled up in unused junk DNA and has not been activated by the RNA enzyme cellular replication process. Far from making these blue bloods anything as fanciful as interdimensional reptiles from Draco, scientific evidence indicates that it is likely due to the redistribution of populations over the generations itself, causing the activation of certain adaptive and newly necessary to survival junk DNA molecules while deactivating others. Some populations, though dispersed to different parts of the world, continue perpetuating certain genetic combinations over the generations, while others propagate different combinations. Gradually, some genetic differences break down as these populations intermingle, while others strengthen. This is the joyous genetic dance called, so crudely, survival of the fittest. The third title is Isosahedron. The isosahedron was associated with the force of air by the Greek philosophers. This is why Plato, author of the Socratic Dialogues, called the pre-Socratics sophists, because while they considered pure philosophy tautological solipsism on the element's ephemeral characteristics, Plato's avatar Socrates described these traits by attributing them to the five regular solids. This philosophy of idealizing the regular mathematical constructs in our dimension over the more ephemeral traits of natural forces in themselves is itself all too egocentric to be questioned, although, as always, great pride reveals a fatal flaw. If examined, the original attributes of the four terrestrial elements, plus spirit, representing the force of gravityless tachyonic light, have an esoteric attribution. According to more recent research, however, this arrangement is a carefully coded message. It is decoded by rearranging the attributions of forces and shapes by creating two columns, one of the five solids and one of the five elements, and then going down one line and up the other. For example, the force of air was associated by the Greek philosophers with the isosahedron. The force of air is listed as occurring third by the classical and traditional order of elements, evenly on the two-column list with the isosahedron, if written by the Greek correspondence values. However, if we turn one column upside down, then the isosahedron will be associated with fire, and the element of air will be associated with the dodecahedron, which itself had previously represented cosmos, or spirit, which is then exchanged for the tetrahedron, which to the Greeks represented fire, and so forth. And so, the Rosicrucian isosahedron is associated with the element of fire, however, and not with the Greek element of air. Also, just as the Platonic solids were held as ideal above the elements, and were yet misattributed, so too do the Platonic solids rightly describe the terrestrial elemental traits, such as the dodecahedron representing the zodiac, the tetrahedron representing flame, cube, earth, etc. 
However, the platonic solids themselves are inferior to the universal elemental forces, the strong and weak nuclear, electromagnetic forces, and the force of gravity. Therefore, the platonic solid of the isosahedron here describes the higher fire and the lower air. However, we Rosicrucians invert these attributes for the isosahedron a second time, such that it represents terrestrial flame and universal air, that is, the electromagnetic force. We do this in order to remember that, to describe the higher element of fire, the universal weak nuclear force, we use the platonic solid the Greeks attributed to air, and that we use the same platonic solid to describe the higher element of air, the electromagnetic force, as we use to describe the lower element of the flame. Remember that both of fire and air each have three components. Fires are the fuel, the flame, and the smoke. The airs are clear, clouds, and storm. Fire's fuel is air, and so fire draws air in towards it. It creates a funnel of radiative heat upwards, defying Earth's gravity. Air's fuel is water, and air draws water in towards it. It creates a vacuum of carbonized smoke or ionized mist that condensates water vapor. All the terrestrial elements have three components. The higher elements are simply the four universal forces. The fourth title is electromagnetism. EM refers to the electromagnetic force, that is, the force that carries the visible color spectrum. Of course, we know there are more colors of radiative photon wavelengths than we can see. However, when we look directly at these phantom colors, they only appear to us as infrared and ultraviolet. This is another reason the distant galaxies look red-shifted, because the gaseous chemical components of all the stars are comprised of substances that do not reflect colors that appear in the visible color spectrum, but only show up using radio wave, X-ray, or even gamma wave spectral analysis. These colors, like the chemical contents of the gases giving them off, appear in a quantitatively different set of characteristics for our physical environment than we have got words to describe or even eyes to see, let alone the imagination to catalog. In the same way that stellar gases can be super dense or airy, the colors they emanate are photon rays whose wavelengths are so long or so short or that move so fast or so slowly that we do not refer to them as photons anymore. We call the vibrations that occur on this level electromagnetic radiation, and we call photons electromagnetic radiation. However, to indicate that photons are only a part contained within the full electromagnetic spectrum. Below ultraviolet, or very slow-moving, long-wavelength photon radiation, lie the radio wave frequencies. Below the radio wave frequencies, which can carry pulsed sequences or encoded messages that can be amplified and made audible to the human ear, are x-rays that can penetrate soft tissue but leave a shadow of bone matter on a certain kind of x-ray sensitive film. Below x-rays are gamma rays, and these occur in random bursts throughout the galaxy, as well as throughout intergalactic space. Using a certain type of spectroscopy telescope, we can record the distant emissions of these gamma ray bursts. However, we have not yet, to my knowledge at the time of this writing, recorded an actual gamma ray burst as it was occurring. This is because, as I said, they pop into and out of existence seemingly at random throughout our galaxy and throughout deep space, never appearing in the same place twice. 
All of this comprises the EM spectrum inferior to photon radiation, which is believed to be the fastest speed of radiation possible, given the limited self-correcting and auto-correlated laws of universal physics. However, in the same manner and fashion as we can imagine going faster than the fastest speed we are told is physically possible, so too does the actual EM spectrum encompass even wavelengths faster than photons and should be thought of as including even wavelengths slower than gamma rays, such as the quantum particles of the weak and strong nuclear forces. In fact, there is as much more beyond the known number of elemental forces that we see spirit begins, splits or halves, and ends the elemental tetragrammaton in the form of the three mothers, Aleph, supernal air, Mem, supernal water, and Shin, supernal fire, each duly replaced by one of the three fathers, Yod, Mercury, He, salt, and Vav, sulfur. We have comprehension of the possible existence of worlds lower than that of our perception, that vibrate as wavelengths so long and slow that we can only perceive them as the aeons of time, the ice ages, etc., and of worlds higher than that of our perception, that vibrate wavelengths so short and so fast that they seem to us to be going backward in time. All of this can be understood. The very long wavelengths are fractals of the very small wavelengths. The very small wavelengths are gnomons of the fractals. A gnomon is a living or self-replicating pattern. A fractal is a dead or self-terminating pattern. Gnomons appear as dark space in fractals. For example, the Mandelbrot set, as a gnomon, appears at very small resolution of the Julius set, a Fibonacci spiral, However, the Julius set does not appear as a dark space pattern smaller than or within the Mandelbrot set. This is the difference between a fractal and a gnomon. It is also the difference between something moving one direction, say up for forward in time, and something moving the opposite direction, say down for backwards in time. A very long, slow wavelength constitutes our forward time flow. Very fast microwaves comprise quantum moving opposite this direction in time. The forward flow we call uppercase G for massive gravity. The backward flow we call lowercase g for subatomic gravity. But the macrocosmic G is the same as the microcosmic G, and already this Hermes thrice blessed is nothing. It has been known to we Rosicrucians for quite some time, all these things. We have known about all this for long enough to enshroud it in ten million meanings. But I tell you, as much as I have revealed here, so much more shall be revealed in the higher levels. This lesson teaches us not to forget that the term EM for the spectrum is as arbitrary as calling the sum of all matter energy only the nuclear forces or the gravitational force alone. It has these four features in each universe equal to or lesser than our own, however in each combination in different ratios, as each of our own universes baby universes that collectively comprise the multiverse encapsulating around our own universe, are formed from matter swallowed into the black holes at the centers of spiral galaxies. However, in any universe greater than our own, there would be more than four forces. This is because, just as time, as a single direction, is added to the three-dimensional directions of local space, so too is there a dimension for the inversion or the opposite direction of time, and so too is there a holographic motion of involution in every part and thus overall throughout the whole. 
involution alternates interiorizing or contraction and exteriorizing or expansion. This is the Kabbalistic running and returning. The fifth title is Mars. Just as the heavenly body we now know as Mars was once known to the Greeks as Ares, the god of war, so too does this title not pertain to the planet or to the metal of Mars, so much as it does to the Olympic dignitary over the camia or the relevant sized number square. For example, in the Greek camia of the Olympic dignitaries, we see that for five of the seven later planetary Olympic camia, magic number squares, there are two signs in the zodiac assigned, and one for each of the other two. If you draw a circle and divide it into twelve sections, and then connect those sections in a hatching pattern of parallel lines like Venetian blinds, you will find that five lines divide the circle across, and then a sixth line partitions the final space into two. Therefore, when we Rosicrucians say Mars, in this sense we mean the Olympic Camia Dignitary over two signs of the Zodiac. In other words, we mean him as Ares, the god of war, governing over Ares and Scorpio in the ecliptic Zodiac. It should also be noted that the planet Mars appears to our eyes to be the color red, this, it should be remembered, can be significant of the color blue, and vice versa. Therefore, Mars, though the god of war, can also be associated with the rose, which in turn represents the grand cross alignment of Mars with the other Olympic dignitaries in the heavenly spheres. Remember that Mars's opposite is Venus, just as the opposite color on the spectrum from red is blue and vice versa. The sixth and seventh titles are Aries and Scorpio. Aries, the goat constellation, is traditionally thought of as being a spring sign. This is false. The so-called sun sign of astrology is backdated to how the sky was shaped 2,000 years ago. In other words, we are told if we were born on such and such a date, then we were born under such and such a sign. However, this sign that they tell us, the sun sign they call it, is not accurate to the actual way the stars were oriented around the planet at the date when you were actually born. The entire sun sign positioning is based on a fixed date approximately 2,000 years before the year 2000. Now, since Pope Gregory adjusted the calendar by 16 days from the Roman solar calendar developed by Ptolemy, adopted by Julius Caesar, then it could always be argued that those 16 days comprise a brief holiday period that can be as easily pasted in as an arbitrary year zero as it was cut out by the Pope. So we can say that either 2,000 years before the year 2000, and we can say that in the year zero, when we say that, although calendricists assure us it never actually occurred. Should the need arise, one could always posit the year zero as being comprised of, at least, the 16 days edited out of the Gregorian calendar. There are, of course, countless other holidays that become forgotten or lost in the sands of time, there have been shifts in the calendars of as many different people as there have been calendars. For as long as people have been keeping calendars, there have been different times at which one of them needed to be brought up to date with and made to correspond with another one, and so for the two, from that point on, to be combined into the form of a single, more or less unified calendar. We see this in the case of the Mayans who followed the Olmecs, combining the most likely Nazcan 
lunar tonal model with the most probably Incan solar hab or vague year and who were in their own turn conquered by the Aztec century or calendar round. We likewise see this as the case in Egypt where the immigrant Hyksos from Babylon installed the solar civic calendar of 36 10 day weeks. So too did the Julian solar overtake and absorb the Ptolemaic hieratic era version of the Egyptian civic calendar as had the civic solar calendar of Egypt replace the Sothic lunar calendar, so did the Gregorian revision replace the Julian. These should not be thought of as replacing one another, though, only as modernizing and updating the prior popular mechanisms for measuring the temporal increments of daily business. If one system has lagged too far behind, such as the Sothic year that was based on the Hillelical rising of Sirius to begin the sowing season in pre-dynastic Egypt. Then it is merged, along with its culture, into the closest, more accurate calendrical system. This is how the synthesis of cultures occurs. It is for this reason we describe the synthesis of cultures using the symbol of the pyramid, and the number three. So we have the three great pyramids of Giza, side by side with three queen pyramids. These stand as a stone testimony to the monumental edifices capable of being erected in the name of this knowledge, that is, the knowledge of the pyramids and the number three. Know that the four-sided pyramids of architecture are but a symbol for the four-sided tetrahedron. Both an architectural pyramid and a tetrahedron have the same number of triangular sides. Therefore, they are symbolically interchangeable. So, if each architectural pyramid is a symbol of a tetrahedron, then the significance of there being three pyramids, comprised of twelve triangles in total, is obviously in reference to the zodiac. Thus we see that the archetypal pyramid is a symbol of a civilization already established, and we see that the meaning of the three pyramids is that of an intersection point of meeting between two or multiple established civilizations. These overlap one another's populations, biding their time until it is time for a calendar to decide between them. Under the Kamiya dignitary Mars, ruler of war, in the sign of fire, that is, by the measurements of the tetrahedron, and representing a sum of three, comes Aries, the ram's horn sign of the zodiac. Aries is a fire sign, meaning that, for now, it occurs in spring. The first fourth of the year, beginning with Aries, is all fire signs. Aries is a movable or changing sign in spring. This means that, as the twelve permutation sets of the four elements revolve around one another as the seasons corresponding to certain signs of the zodiac, so too then does the sign for that season in any given era correspond to a planetary ruler. As I have said, Aries is commonly attributed as ruling over the earliest month of spring. However, this is not accurate to the place this constellation actually occupies in the sky on those dates. The place that astrologers use to construct birth charts to mark the sign of the month in which you were born is called the sun sign, and it is a distinctly different concept than the rising sign that is actually rising above the horizon at the exact time you were born. The sun sign is fixed to when the rising signs all were at the time of Christ. For example, we say that Aries is the sun sign of the first month of spring. This does not mean that Aries is rising in the first month of spring anymore. The rising sign differs from the sun sign now by one full month. Now, Aries rises in the second month of spring. 
Therefore, if you are born in the second month of spring, you would have Aries as your rising sign. And if you are born in the first month of spring, you will have Aries as your sun sign. Therefore, Scorpio, being a water sign of later fall, actually permutes out to be an air sign of early winter. This is how we measure the precession of the seasons. It is also interesting to note that Aries, by shifting from the starting month of spring to the middle month of spring, has, by now, assumed dominance over the date on which the planet Earth is at perihelion to the Sun, meaning it is located on the position of its elliptical orbit closest to the Sun. This date we celebrate as Easter, and its esoteric name is the Spring Equinox. For Aries to have switched places into this position means that, from the point of view of the fixed date of Spring Perihelion, or Equinox, a new era or aeon has begun, the era or aeon of Aries, where Aries is the rising sign during the spring equinox. This occurs for the opposite perihelion point on Earth's solar orbit, the middle sign of fall, as well as the longest days and nights experienced at the aphelion points in Earth's orbit, those being the ones furthest away from the sun that is, the summer and winter solstices. Therefore, when we Rosicrucians refer to the dawning of the spring equinox era of Aries, we mean the same thing as those who refer to the dawning of the winter solstice era of Aquarius. The only difference is that they are celebrating the false dawn of the sun sign of Aquarius, changing to the solstice dates of winter while we are referring to the true dawn of the rising sign of Aries changing to the spring equinox date. So, in other words, the age of Aquarius is our exoteric way of saying age of Aries in esoteric wisdom. All this may seem confusing at first, but it will become clear over time. Remember that for the rising sign, the era to follow the one we are in now, will be winter equinox Scorpio. There is much more here that can be said about the changing of the eons. We have plenty of time to learn of this phenomenon and about its effects on nature. Also, I am available for questions. The eighth title is Neshima. Neshima is an old Hebrew word that denoted to the minds of the Jews up until the Babylonian captivity, the same idea that the English word spirit denotes to us now. The Neshima could be the individual spirit, expressed as one's charisma, or the spirit of a town or place that similarly expressed its general character. The spirit of a place was usually represented by one of its indigenous fauna of animals, and the spirit of a town was usually expressed as an idol of the spirit animal placed on the hearth in the center of each citizen's home. Although they do not recognize it as such, many people still practice the worship of animal idols in the form of worship of indigenous species of fauna to the Hebrews following the conversion of Abraham in the desert, when he was prepared to sacrifice his sons to his Elohim for blessing him with the tables of Ram, the records of history. The Neshima, as the spirit of the individual, has been considered sacred, while the spirit of the animal, the place, or the town has been considered profane. This differentiation of the interior spirit from the exterior spirits has caused an interesting and probably unforeseen difficulty in explaining that the spirit is all around us and within us both, and that, although each of us has our own individual soul, there is only one spirit for the entire universe. We, as Rosicrucians, 
recognize the universal spirit as the idealized pattern of periodicity that occurs in between all the aperiodic patterns in our universe. This is what we call the spirit, or neshima, pure geometry, encompassing all the dimensional expressions of shape and form. This is the G between the Masonic square and compass, where the square measures pattern in two dimensions, and the compass creates shape in the second dimension from the third dimension down. The G of Freemasonry is meant to allude to the higher dimensional geometry as more ideal, implied by the regular polygons in two dimensions and the five three-dimensional platonic solids as being ideal. Therefore, we associate the G of geometry with the spirit or neshima of the universe. Geometry makes measurements on one dimension from the next dimension above. So too are all these dimensional geometries for our local universe combined and compared as only one unified field of study to the dimension of the Most High, which is a field of study higher even than the study of geometry, that is, the spirit of the universe. In the same way as the soul is said to exist after the body has died, and, in some cases, to have existed before a particular body was born, so we say then the soul is immortal. It was created and had a beginning, but it continues to exist without end. So we Rosicrucians say of the spirit, or Neshima, that it is eternal. It has always existed, without beginning, and it will always exist without end. Here we see that this is true for a measurement of universal law, even more so than for any given universal law itself. So we associate the spirit as eternal with the measurement governing patterns occurring over time. Therefore, we say that the pattern of our soul over time approaches the purest, most periodic interval possible. We call this purest interval possible the spirit, or the neshima, and we call geometry itself the spirit, or neshima, of the universe. Therefore, we say that for each different pattern there is an ideal, stable, or periodic state. We say, therefore, there are many different spirits, but that there are fewer spirits than there are patterns of motion in general. These spirits, or meta-patterns, are each more or less unique. However, the entire aggregate of all of them also averages out to a single meta-meta-pattern. This meta-meta-pattern, or universal spirit, does not appear from the outside to change over time. It contains all the motions of the universe but its exterior surface is far beyond the local material universe. The meta-pattern of all forms is a spiral. The meta-meta-pattern of all spirals is a torus. Thus we say there is the eternal neshima below, and there is the eternal neshima above, meaning there is the spiral spirit of each, and there is the Taurus spirit of all, but that both these forms, as pure geometrical patterns, surpass the limits of the material local universe. Therefore, we Rosicrucians call the Taurus the spirit above and the spiral the spirit below. We call the spiral in the Taurus the spirit of man, and we call the representation of the spiral in the Taurus, Phi over Pi, the spirit of the universe, or the body of God, the Kab Allah, or the Kabbalah. Just as the spirit, or Neshima, of man is the spiral in the Taurus made manifest, 
and real in the material universe, so too is the geometry of phi over pi, the body of God idealized as pure geometry in the higher dimensions beyond time. The spirit of man kneels before the body of God, and so too does the body of God rise up into a higher spirit to serve man, his most beloved creature. This concludes the knowledge lecture of the titles of Five Degree Regal Rosicrucian. Here is a knowledge lecture for the various titles of the perfected Illuminati. The first title is District. This title refers to the position of due guards outside the once and future Senate of Camelot and of Atlantis. The district directors referred to in the literature of the modern IOBB2, Illuminati Order Bulletin Board 2, are the outermost watchmen of the order. Usually eight to ten meet together, but in an emergency, only as few as four or five need to attend. The Illuminati Order has been in a declared state of emergency since its inception in 1776 and subsequent expulsion from Bavaria. Therefore, no fewer than five members need to be present to actively constitute a lodge, which does not need to have walls. A lodge or club can meet in an ale hall or can convene in a wooded clearing like a coven. The role of the do guard in an open lodge is to collect the proper grip and password. The grip should be given by the left hand to the guard on the right side and the password, if on one's person, passed with the right hand to the do guard on the left. At the same time, all three, both do guards standing guard outside the door of the lodge and the person seeking to gain entrance to that lodge, should then say the proper phrase for that lodge. The role of the district director in a closed lodge is to follow the Lodge Ambassador, the Scottish Rite Templar level of POD, and the Regional Directors, the Rosicrucian Golden Dawn of POD, and only sit on the bench after they have. We keep one eye always on the nearest door, and one eye always on the nearest window. We trust the Regional Directors and they trust the Lodge Grand Masters. We watch the Regional Director convey the report of the Lodge Ambassador to the Lodge Grand Master, the Essene York Rite in POD, who would then convey the report to the Area Directors, the Bohemian OTO of POD. However, if the report is delivered any farther than this, we must wait for a special sign to be given from within and this sign will let us know how to act in accord to the password presented within by ourselves as the do guard from the person seeking to gain entrance. There are five seats for every bench, and we are the ones that occupy the seat on the end closest to our lodge's door. Next to us sits the regional Rosicrucian, Next to the regal Rosicrucian representative from our lodge sits the Templar ambassador, the Tyler, or guardian at the great stained glass windows behind the bench. He sits facing away from the Senate proceedings, looking out at the window, keeping watch, just as we sit straddling the bench, facing away from our lodge brothers looking back toward the door, keeping watch for Cowans, peeping Thomases, and spies. We are the larger part of the armed regiment. There are ten of us that guard outside the Senate doors, 
two at the door into each lodge, and we take the passwords and give the grips. The other armed guards are the Tylers, but they stay inside for the most part. Inside the Senate, everything is arranged like a giant cobweb. If there is a fly caught in one area, immediately all the spiders in all the other areas will know. On each lodge bench sit five wise senators. There are the Dew Guard, the Attendant, the Tyler, the Grand Master, and the Chair for each of the four elements, for water, for fire, for air, and for earth. In the center there are three pillars, each with a chair next to it. The four benches and the three pillars are the twenty-three seats of the Senate. However, the number of senators present and in attendance at any time is not strictly set to that combination of numbers. For example, when convening an ecumenical senate, the fifth lodge is closed and a spirit lodge is opened with a bench of four senators, limiting the other elemental lodge benches also to four senators. Just as there is a difference between the total number of senators and the total number of votes, so too is there a difference between the number of Illuminati that can constitute a lodge. It is said that usually five meet, and that they are then considered an invisible hand of the Illuminati. However, just as four must find one to three, so two must five find one or two, and one or two is one fewer to find than one to three. The goal in forming an Illuminati hand known amongst the Church of the Subgenius as a stark fist or clutch, is to advance it to become a church comprised of one OTO degree, two Illuminati degree, and three Rosicrucian degrees, or to constitute an executive committee, the stark fist of removal or retrieval in Subgenius lingo, of seven members. Think of Illuminism as like a political party among the modern church and state of the perfect order. However, Illuminism, Rosicrucianism, the chivalric and philosophical degrees of Masonry, as well as the modern Bohemian OTO, all collectively known as the Bund degrees of the order, are more than merely political paradigms. They are psychological patterns formed naturally whenever certain numbers of people meet in groups. The savage pecking order of the watering hole demonstrates this point across many levels. Just as does a church convene of six and an executive council of seven, so does a clutch of Illuminati convene of five. Just so, in every group of seven, the dominant one will guide the philosophies of four, though they will betray one and one will betray them. Such are the seasons of the Pope played out in every group of seven. Seven is less stable than six, but more stable than five. One of the chief goals of Illuminism is to restore Atlantean democracy. To do this, the Illuminati have reconstructed the Senate with an odd number of members, all of whom, save the Pope, may be trusted to not abstain, in order to ensure a regular flow for the law. The Illuminati are particularly interested in expanding upon the fractal of odd primes. The second sign of the Illuminati is the color yellow. The sun symbol of the Illuminati is the circle with a dot at the center. It is a symbol for a total solar eclipse, similar to the Mobius strip symbol 
for the duality of positive and negative infinity manifesting in the sun and moon. A similar symbol is the symbol of the Tao, or the Way, in Chinese Zen. Here we see the familiar yin-yang motif, however with a twist. We see the sun and moon pass through each other, like a dragon eating its tail. The opposite tint of yellow is blue, but the opposite hue of light from yellow is violet. Thus, the true opposite of yellow would be something similar to an average between blue and violet, namely indigo. However, if you examine the light of the eclipse, you will see that an indigo sun surrounds a blue moon to produce violet light in the sky. Because the local sun is yellow, everything that we see, each photon that strikes our eyes, has been spun more toward the yellow portion of the spectrum before and after being reflected off any object. The opposite of this light source, then, is not the absence of it such as at night. It is the ultraviolet sky scorched away of the yellow hue and made crystal clear during a solar eclipse. The indigo sun represents Tifereth, and the blue moon, Yesod. We see the alignment of the sun and moon occurring on May 5th, 2000, and we see it occurring again on December 21st, 2012. Yesod means the foundation, and Tifereth means the beauty. So, when we look at the solar eclipse, what we are seeing is how everything looked in the Garden of Eden when the light source of the Creator was eclipsed from Paradise by the creation. Just as we discussed the astrophysical sun and the moon as individual elements to be of a lesser degree of force than the cosmological emanations of Tifereth and Yesod, that is, the product of their union, so too is the relationship between the lesser light of photons and the greater light of tachyons. Just as at night and during an eclipse, when the yellow light of the sun is removed, does the sky appear as it truly is, clear. So too is the difference between the photon fields of near zero mass and the tachyon wells of ZPE. Just as even only one single photon emits visible light radiation, Cherenkov radiation, so too is the tachyon, an invisible hypersphere that surrounds and permeates the photon. The closest approximation to understanding the tachyonic torus surrounding the photon would be to compare it to the differential rotation of the sun's gaseous surface as it winds up the longitudinal electromagnetic field lines until they become latitudinal. The reason for the sun's differential rotation is the precession of its EM poles, the same as our own here on Earth, which in both cases of our planet and our sun are offset from the actual geographical location of the mass's polar rotation. So each photon blazes and seethes with infinite tachyons in much the same way as a star is a nuclear furnace emitting near infinite photons. This light that we see emitted from a single photon, Cherenkov radiation, however, is colored like the sun's photons are, yellow. In order to see the true form of tachyons, you have to obscure the direct light of the photons. Once your eyes adjust, then you will be able to see more clearly the invisible patterns that appear in the empty air. Unlike stars and photons, the clear light of tachyons shines but does not burn. It is not a sign such as fire that consumes fuel for the flame to convert into smoke. 
nor is it a sign such as air that can be clear, cloudy, or stormy, nor like water that can be ice, liquid, or gas. It is like a combination of all three of these traits, water, fire, air, combined to describe the ether above. However, just as the dot in the circle sun sign can be used to represent photons, so too can the alchemical sulfur sign stand for the clear light of tachyons. In sulfur are mixed chemical air, cloud, water, gas, and fire, smoke. It is the airiest of the air elements, yet its stench is associated with Satan. This is there to remind us to be sensitive to the change in smell of our setting. Remember that even a rarefied change, such as one in air temperature or pressure, can be a telling sign. And again, just as there may only be odor to remind us of the presence of sulfur, so too are invisible tachyons glittering gloriously along all levels impossible to miss once one is aware of them. And just as sulfur's tint is yellow, so too can the otherwise invisible tachyons be seen only when near an emission source, such as a photon, or in the gas jets of the poles of a black hole. This is the dual nature of light. There is the greater and the lesser. The greater light is tachyons. The lesser light is photons. The greater light is clear, but requires an object to eclipse between itself and its more massive counterpart, the photon, for its true and invisible patterns to become apparent. The more massive counterpart, the photon itself, radiates like a star such as our sun. Tachyons are so much smaller than the supposedly massless photon that they only even appear when their trajectories are Doppler shifted by the photon surface well. At this point they appear as Cherenkov radiation. Therefore, while the exoteric color associated with the Illuminati is yellow, the esoteric color of the Illuminati is actually clarity the trance of Samad High in Buddhism, achievement of Nirvana to the Hindu, Christ consciousness to the Western mystics, Kether of Shekinah to the Kabbalist, ego death to a psychologist. When the mind is clear of all motion of thought, when there is no electrical kinetic activity in the neural tissue of the cerebrum, then the emotions will become still and the heart will calm. As this happens, the light of the true sun will increase its brightness and the invisible patterns will become clear and the true illumination of God, that is, his vision and his voice, will come down upon you. It is because this method of clearing out the self allows the influx of God that this trance of clarity is called illumination. The light increases. The third symbol of the Illuminati order is the dodecahedron. When the Illuminati order was created by Adam Weishaupt, it was a very different organization than it is today as a branch of Freemasonry. In its initial conception, Weishaupt's Illuminati appealed to Freemasonry, however, by now having been accepted into the Philosophical Lodge for some 200 years, Illuminism and Freemasonry have become irreversibly intermingled to the extent that Illuminism is considered the true Masonry and that all former Masonry was a fallen and degenerate form of Illuminism. Consider, for example, the role of the Dew Guard. They are made aware of both the outside and the inside of the Lodge, 
as well as, originally, the inside of the Atlantean Senate as well. They stood guard outside the lodge doors, entered in through the lodge using the same passwords and grips as they themselves collected outside, and shared a seat on the Senate bench with all the other members of their lodge. However, since the time of Atlantis, the biblical city of Enoch, the high degree of civilization therein, was also lost. This treasure, however, was buried before the flood and survived underground, in one form or another, until the present. The keys to this high degree of civilization are now the lost word and keys of Freemasonry. Illuminism's promise is to restore these. And in many ways it has. However, to accomplish this restoration, it has been set in counterpoint to the civilization and its values that has arisen in the interim. Christianity, the belief in a single ubermensch, pales by comparison to the global civilization of Atlantis. However, this is the best that the chattel can imagine for their perfect world. Therefore, to set the world into the proper order, much of the civilization that the chattel cherish must be destroyed. That is the burden of Illuminism. However, the movement within Freemasonry, known now as the Illuminati, did not begin until nearly 1776. It has had much fear of change and conservative reactionaries to contend with. It has only managed to advance the world as far toward global reunification in the past 200 years as global conflict and free trade, which is, obviously, quite a ways in terms of technological progress compared to the Dark Ages, however, still a long way from being Atlantis. The Renaissance Rosicrucianism that was resuscitated by Illuminism has impacted into science fiction dystopias, and the dreams of a new Atlantis are being stunted in some by tension over the Christian calendrical millennium. Among some, the success of Atlantean democracy is considered a mystery, and likewise, some venerate the ineffability of all such mysteries so much that they consider the entire endeavor to solve these mysteries, recover the lost keys of masonry, and restore Atlantis, collectively nothing but metaphysics and mysticism. These people comprise the present mode of thinking that Illuminism seeks to root out and to eventually completely overcome. These people venerate the veil without accepting the apocalypse of the abyss. That is why there is a division in the vision. The division, however, as it is manifest now, is one between church and state. This issue has caused there to arise two factions in the present order that preserves the perennial tradition. This division appears to be between the quasi-religion type degrees and the executive and administrative type degrees, i.e., between exoteric church and state. This is considered, by the modern chattel, the cornerstone of democracy. However, this is the main difference between modern democracy and Atlantean democracy. In Atlantis, there was no church. There was no need for one. This is the message of the Illuminati. However, though we are opposed to religion, we realize the need to enter into it in our modern times in order to dissolve it from within. This is the reason no church of the order can be recognized without one Illuminatus member. It may seem like it would probably be better if an Essene were allowed to take our place in the religious sphere, but it is necessary for all of us to achieve our goal that they should not. Illuminism is a movement of science. 
As such, we advocate deism. However, we are actually closest to atheists in our hearts. This does not mean we do not know and love God. It means we lack belief in the lesser God described to us by the chattel. Unlike the Rosicrucians, we will not work with the chattel by curtailing our curriculum to suit their tastes. We will not mince words and say, the Pope is the Antichrist, out of one side of our mouths, but say, Jesus is the true way out of the other. We tell the truth. Man is God. This is why the teaching method of Ben Padia, do not cast pearls before swine, is the watchword of the wise man today. This is why much of what the Rosicrucians published as a compromise between the truth and Christianity is replicated without amendment or revision in the mass media today, not because we do not recognize the inherent errors in the grimoires, always on the side of Christianity, nor because we do not have easy access to the true content of these grimoires, but because we publish what will whet the appetite of those who otherwise would not seek truth at all. That, like the Rosicrucians, they should then seek us out. We have created the New Age movement of the modern mass media. It is the caricature of the New World Order movement in politics, the movement of globalism. Of course, the heads of the New World Order movement in politics do not need to understand astrology any more so than some fool in a Magic the Gathering group would be able to read the mind of the U.S. President. This is the continuing separation of church and state within the order. Neither the New Agers nor the New World Order proponents have foresight enough to see the restoration of Atlantean democracy, let alone to understand their own actions now by attempting to unify the world prematurely, and thus religiously, are only plunging the world into a necessary and a temporary chaos. The heads of state and the chiefs of the church are all, by now at least, Illuminati. The fourth meaning is given for the letter G, the force of gravity. Just as there is a weak force and a strong force of atomic energy, so too are there phased states for the force of gravity. The strong gravity force is photons, the particles being large enough for us to see with our bare eyes. The weak gravity force is tachyons. While the strong force seems integral to our perception and understanding of our universe, comprising the entire spectrum of visible radiation, that is, the EM force, it is the weak force of gravity that is actually more essential, anthropically, for the existence of our universe, because, by the involution of their surfaces, simultaneously moving forward and backward, they determine the directions of linear time. Some incorrectly associate the seeming strong and weak force of gravity with the terms gravity A and gravity B. In fact, gravity A is a term used to indicate micro subquantum gravity, and gravity B is a term used to indicate macro astrophysical gravity. The terms gravity A and gravity B are close enough for government work since they are commonly used by military physicists while micro and macro are used more by metaphysicians with the preferred terms among astrophysicists and quantum mechanics still being wells and fields based on EM type quantum characteristics. So if I say gravity wells occur on astrophysical levels and that gravity fields predominate on subquantum levels. 
you should understand that this means the same thing as saying gravity B is macrogravity and gravity A is microgravity. However, you should also bear in mind that macrogravity, or gravity B, etc., is not one-to-one -one synonymous with the greater light of tachyons, and that microgravity, or gravity A, etc., is not one-to-one -one synonymous with the lesser light of photons. Instead, both gravities A and B, that is, the microscopic and the macroscopic forces of gravity, are relative to the greater light of tachyons. All this pertains to what the military calls ZPE, or zero-point energy, energy that exists below that of the massless photon. So, the force of gravity is really above that of EM, the spectral emissions of light, as the greater light above the lesser, and the forces of microgravity, A, and macrogravity, B, are equal above. Or, rather, they are equal, but both are lesser than the true light of tachyons. Gravity A and gravity B comprise the dual nature of linear time. However, time, being the fourth experiential, temporal, and fourth actual spatial dimensions, is actually one dimension lower than the fifth dimension of pure light, the clear light that illuminates tachyons. For just as tachyons shine through photons, causing their Cherenkov radiative light, so too does the true light of spirit shine through tachyons, causing their invisible involution. And even this dimension is only the outer gates of the prime mover. That is why the G of gravity is less than the G of geometry, and the G of geometry, that is the measurement of all space permeating all dimensions, is yet less than the G of God. This is, of course, how the ordered mind would order things, and, in the beginning, there was perfect periodicity. However, by now, having long since passed the point of universal critical mass, when the collapsed string dimensions begin to fray, and the shells shatter, and the universe begins producing a multiverse of baby universes inside black holes. All things appear aperiodic, warped, and distorted. So, even though the Rosicrucians were, in their time, able to communicate the ideal of perfect periodicity to the Christians, we Illuminati now see this as impossible to explain to the same audience for the reason of the Millennium's distractions. However, if we were to have to prove ourselves to the chattel, using the mystic mysteries of mathematics, to awe and astound them, we would have to go looking for the proper equations and relationships, not in periodicity, but in aperiodicity. There, we would confuse all the perfect terms to arrive at a suitably confusing, yet right, answer so as to confound the astounded masses. For example, take E equals MC squared. Everyone will assure you it is true, based on the evidence of the atomic bomb, but no one in all the lands can explain to you what exactly it means. There is to the chattel, the children of heaven, Christ called them, no repetition without modification, and the only non-compromisable thing is compromise. If quizzed by the chattel on the math of higher dimensions, which they will associate with their home, heaven, explain to them the following correspondences. Gravity is negentropic, attractive, and mnemonic. Time itself is entropic, repulsive, and fractal. Explain to them that entropy, 
is the forward flowing motion of the standard arrow of time explain to them that wells of gravity are themselves the statistical improbability and that one like life itself must struggle to come into existence and to maintain itself even for a relatively short time tell them therefore we use the term nomon to refer to negantropic gravitational or living patterns and the term fractal to refer to entropic temporal or dead patterns even though in essence both are patterns themselves because they like a hologram replicate the same design on smaller and larger scales in this way you can explain hyperspatial mathematics even to a Bedouin Arab and you can discuss the nature of spirit even with an atheist rocket scientist therefore understand the pure claim of perfect periodicity but realize that though it is reflected like ripples in a pond it is not itself anywhere pure calm or periodic anywhere in this universe and the local universe is all the chattel are likely to ever know about see also that tachyons carry the force of gravity over the force of electromagnetism however that this reflects or reverses upside down beneath the speed of photons such that photons appear on the surface to be the force of electromagnetism over the force of gravity therefore even though these words have a somewhat different more ideal meaning to us as Illuminati to the chattel you can explain to them that photons represented by the yellow circle dot symbol of the Sun are actually weak gravity and that these manifest themselves as forward flowing entropic fields of gravity they will understand this then tell them that strong gravity is tachyons manifesting as backward flowing negantropic wells of gravity tell them one is above and one is below then they will think they understand and then they will know what you tell them is true explain to them that gravity wells are like the chakras and that gravity fields are like the aura explain to them patiently about the holographic nature of light but do not by any means attempt to explain to them that the chakras of the aura are equivalent to the karma of the soul do not attempt to explain to them that the true nature of gravity as temporal is relative to the spatial nature of photons and do not attempt to explain to them anything yet about phi over pi if you explain these things to the drones and the chattel and if you show them the diagram explaining to them the shape of the tachyon then they might begin to get a grip on controlling their own finances by applying their newfound understanding and we wouldn't want that instead just show them the solar symbol of the Illuminati the circle with the dot in the center and tell them it is a cone instead show them the eye in the triangle design and explain to them it is a symbol of God the all-seeing eye in the Trinity halo but by no means explain to them the evaporation of currency value is equivalent to the withering away of the capitalist dictatorship by the proletariat through the micro miniaturization of information transfer technologies do not let them understand that this evaporation of currency water to air is equivalent to the force of photons gravity under EM and that to generate income from this evaporation of currency is to use tachyons gravitational water over cosmological air or the electromagnetic force to foresee the future 
explain to them that God only knows the mysteries. But keep in mind at all times that to an Illuminati there is no ineffable mystery. The fifth title is Jupiter, King Among the Planetary Rulers. Just as there are various mysteries related to the Illuminati solar symbol, as there are various arrangements of the attributes it denotes, such as the greater and lesser light, tachyons, photons, etc., 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 so too are there multiple interpretations of Jupiter. Nowadays, to say Jupiter to the modern initiate, they may think of the Sephirah judgment or mercy. However, when we Illuminists refer to Jupiter, it is not in its Sephirah sense, but in its planetary sense, as the Hebrew letter Tau, Gematria value 400. The history of Jupiter is many storied, but we must remember it was attributed to the planet first. Then from this did it become relative to a letter in the Hebrew Aleph Bet. Then from this did it become venerated by the Greeks. Then from this, in 20th century Kabbalah, it was associated with the Sephirah of judgment or mercy. This is the order of the history of its meaning. Throughout this history of exoteric meanings, however, there has been an esoteric current in which Jupiter has had another specific meaning, one not known of exoterically yet. Jupiter was associated also by the alchemists with the elemental metal iron opposite on the spectrum from Mercury, and modern esotericists recognize the same polar relationship between Muladhara and Pratilahara, the lowest and highest chakras. The reason for this is not because the planet Jupiter is farther from the solar system's offset center than the planet Mercury. It is because of the Kamiya. The Kamiya, or magic number square associated with Jupiter, is second of the planetary Kamiyas, a square of four by four. The Kamiya are undoubtedly ancient, but their understanding has never been fully accounted for. They were known in linear form to Francis Barrett and are, according to E. A. Wallace Budge, at least as old as Sumer and in India. However, their exact origins are unknown. Tellingly, the place in the zodiac given for each planetary cameo has additional writing within the geometric sigil. This writing is, of course, indecipherable, and is likely the contemporary of ancient Hebrew and linear A and B and is decidedly pre-Phoenician. It seems possible that the seven sigils on the places in the zodiac are actually the ancient prototypes of the modern alphabets. However, this is mere speculation. What is not mere speculation is that there has been a political movement over the last 200 years to restore ideals of society that were considered Atlantean, even by Solon, the father of Greek democracy. The major difference between the movement for Atlantean restoration and the origins of the Kamiya in history is found in the Bible. According to the Hebrews, the events immediately prior to Abraham's expulsion from Ur in Sumer was the building by the people of the Tower of Babel and the dispersion of the peoples following the confusion of the tongues. Abraham, known as Ibruim in contemporary Sumerian records, was the scribal priest of Enlil, the chief deity of Akkad, north of Sumer. As such, he was opposed to the Babylonian expansion that was then overwhelming Kish. 
in the Bible, the Old Testament of Abraham's peoples, these events are described as the first exile of the people when Abraham entered Egypt as Imhotep, builder of the Pyramid of Djoser. Later on, following the exodus out of Egypt and the building of the first temple, Babylon was still around. This was the time of the Babylonian captivity of the Israelites. However, at the time of Abraham, the threat of Babylon was only just emerging. Therefore, the event described as preceding his expulsion from Ur was the building of the Tower of Babel and the confusion of the tongues. At the same time as Abraham left Ur, Lot left Sodom. Just as the Tower of Babel was destroyed, so too was Sodom destroyed. This was when the cameo was first described. Thus, the modern sigils in the places of the zodiac we have to describe the cameo are only as old as later Sumer and are not authentically Atlantean. Of course, because the arrangement of the sigils on the places of the zodiac is based on the arrangement of the number squares comprising the cameo, then there is no way to date when the information of this certain arrangement first became known. That is why we, the Illuminati, consider the cameo to be of the true Atlantis, that is, timeless. The Jupiter, Dugard, place in the zodiac is depicted in red on the diagram associated with the Illuminati degree. Here we see the seven places in the zodiac of the planetary cameo are attributed to the seven colors, and these arranged in a circle around the geometric pattern formed from the arrangement by ratio of the number of squares. The fact that there are seven places in the zodiac, each with its own accompanying indecipherable sigil, indicates that the artifact unearthed by the Essenes was signed by seven rulers. To speculate, these are seven of the ten, supposedly Atlantean kings from before the deluge, does not mean the seven sigils on the cameo necessarily correspond to names of the antediluvian rulers on the Sumerian kings list. We cannot say with certainty when the sigils were inscribed. What we do know is that the places in the zodiac of the planetary sigils are based on an arrangement of the cameo number squares according to ratios. We know that the base 7 and 12 systems can interrelate in various other arrangements also but that the one of these that follows most logically from the cameo arrangement of number squares is one that is not yet properly known of among the Christians and the chattel. It positions the seven planets as bars across a circular zodiac, uniting mere opposite signs. This arrangement has only been implied thus far to the chattel and the Christian Kabbalists by Francis Barrett's linear array of the seven planetary sigils. According to Barrett's linear array, planetary Jupiter rules over Pisces and Sagittarius on the zodiac. However, it is clear here that Barrett is attempting to fuse the two systems of Jupiter, the planet, attributed to the letter Tao, and to the Sephiroth judgment or mercy and Jupiter the four square base seven sigil cameo and its place in the zodiac. However, we should be able to rightly see that the zodiac of the cameo number squares arrangement and the zodiac of the constellations in the Empyrean Heights do not necessarily correspond to one another in a one-to-one -one ratio. Instead, it seems likely to us as Illuminati that the cameo refers to the microscopic as the constellations refer to the macroscopic. 
Jupiter governs over Pisces and Sagittarius. Pisces is a water sign. Sagittarius is an air sign. Now we know that in our year, Sagittarius precedes Pisces by less than Pisces precedes Sagittarius. At this point, in the passage of the Aeons, the constellation we call Pisces, the twin fish, is associated with the flooding of late winter, early spring. As such, when the solar age is Pisces, it will be the end of an ice age in the North Hemisphere. Likewise, when the solar age is Sagittarius, a sign of early winter and later autumn, we recognize as dominant an archetype that, currently, we depict as a centaur archer. So why is it that the exoteric manifestations, the invisible hands of Jupiter, are expressed as twin fish and a horseman? It is not because of the planetary attributes of Jupiter, associating the red-spotted giant with Zeus, the Olympian dignitary of dignitaries. It is because these are the signs on either end when a horizontal bar is drawn across the ecliptic and attributed to Jupiter. The reason for this is the camia. By tracing the mysterious origins of this symbol, the barred zodiac, we can determine the origin dates of knowledge of the camia. This places the first knowledge of the base 7 and 12 systems at the same time as the conception of the modern Hebrew Aleph Bet, wherein Jupiter is equivalent to the letter Tau. The date of the origins of the modern Hebrew Aleph Bet as Aramaic are contemporary to the beginning of Phoenician, following the use of hieroglyphics in Egypt. This corresponds to the end of the Old Kingdom in Egypt and the beginning of the Pharaonic Age, the building of massive pyramids designed by Imhotep, and the first expulsion of Abraham and Lot from Sumer and Akkad. That is why Kabbalist scholars of the Sephardic school were unable to trace the Kamiya back any farther than the time of the Tower of Babel and the confusion of the tongues. It is because this is the earliest they can trace back the use of the barred circle zodiac symbol to represent the Kamiya. However, as we Illuminati know, this does not mean the true Kamiya, that of the arrangement of number squares by ratio, was unknown of before that point. It only proves that it was at the time of the Tower of Babel that the translation of the Kamiya into modern Hebrew could be attributed. So, we can say that the Kamiya was known of at the very beginning of the recorded history of our modern post-flood era. This implies, thus, that it was known of before the flood as well even though any record of its being known would have been lost at that time. Now we Illuminati know that the Kamiya is the foundation cornerstone of Atlantean democracy. However, the difficulty we encounter, and on a daily basis, is exemplified by trying to explain this to the common people, that is, the exoteric chattel or the drones of modern civilization. The trick is to get them to work upon the project without knowing what, in the end, it will be. This is because of their greed. If they were to learn their work would be used to make their superiors immortal, they would desire immortality for themselves. So too, the restoration of Atlantis, rendering the presence of all mankind eternal, would so appeal to the common workers on the great work that they would desire to design it in their own image and thus to rule over the entirety. 
because we cannot allow this to happen. There are some things that we Illuminati do not talk about with the chattel. One of them is the way in which Atlantean democracy is founded on the cornerstone of the Kamiya. Another is the true meaning of the clear light that it is fifth dimensional. We do not talk about phi over pi to the chattel and we do not subscribe to their definitions of God. We do not show them certain signs and seals such as the solar symbol of the Illuminati and if they happen to find these out from us we explain the symbols to the chattel incorrectly to confuse them into awe. We can explain the solar symbol first as a cone, then the triangle as a sign of dialectics, argue Marx and Rand with them, but we will never be able to explain to them the meaning of the rotation of the barred zodiac according to the dual twist method of depiction according to Crowley in the Book of Thoth, not unless they are willing to quit being chattel and become an Illuminatus. That is why we look toward Pisces and Sagittarius to conquer, divide. So, when air and earth, archer and steed of Sagittarius are divided, they become the twin water sign, the two fish of Pisces. This indicates that when these signs were formulated, Pisces represented the spring equinox sign both water, and that Sagittarius was between the autumnal equinox, more earth, and the winter solstice, more air. Of course, this relationship fails to matter compared to what weather these signs denote to the common mind currently. Likewise, just as at the time of the beginning of the Babylonian zodiac, the twelve signs were fixed to the four elements in the form of the four seasons. So, in modern times, the ancient Babylonian zodiac can be associated with the planetary base seven system through the relationship between the base four elements, esoterically the four worlds of Kabbalah, and the base three alchemical elements, esoterically the elements of the four worlds. Because three plus four equals seven, and three times four equals twelve, then we see the base seven and base twelve systems connecting quite easily in the realm of mathematics, and already we have the preserved fragments of the artifact, the places in the zodiac, and the Atlantean sigils. Thus, just as by adding 3 plus 7 plus 12, we arrive at the 22 of the Hebrew Aleph bet, so too do we arrive at 23 when we add 5 times 4 to 3. These are the mysteries of our magic numbers. Only understand, there is no point trying to tell the chattel about these types of things. They will not understand. They will tell you the old ways are better, referring to the Dark Ages. But we Illuminati are here to restore the Atlantean rule of one. One God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all, rules over the nation that aligns itself with these, his ideals. The chattel only understand the opposite form of logic. The all-seeing eye is printed on money. They will see this as evil, placing a sign of the divine on the very surface of the most profane. However, with only a little coaxing, they will come to understand the eye in the triangle does not represent the divine, but a lesser form or state of the divine. Rather than representing omniscience bound, we can tell them, and quite rightly, that it is merely the modern symbolic equivalent 
of the binding through labor of the deity known in Akkad as Shamash, in Sumer as Utu, and in Babylon as Marduk. By binding Marduk, we can explain to them, we place Yadhevadhe supernal to Cthulhu. We can even show them a picture of a pyramid above a labyrinth to stimulate their minds. All this can be done easily enough by us now, but what cannot be done by anyone to our knowledge at this time is to explain to a chattel drone the true old ways were the way of light and the law of one. The final attribute under the auspices of Illuminism is Chia. Chia is the lesser will. Jikaida is the greater will. The lesser will is like a wild animal. The greater will is that beast's trainer. Out of love for the animal, it must be whipped and conditioned and molded into obedience, even if, throughout that time, the punishments and rewards seem arbitrary to the animal, and it does not understand why its master is showing it tough love. Why is this? What is the reason for this? It is because, otherwise, the wild animal would eat the one who instead trains it. Consider the tamed lion. It could easily, if so prompted, devour the flesh of a man in under a minute. However, it is as totally subservient as a common pet. Why is this? Because it has realized the freedom of home. This is like Chia. Chia is the lion with two faces, one tamed, one savage. The Chia is the home of man's highest spirit, of the Kabbalah, the lowest parts, the Kab Allah, flesh of God. That is why the lion is both savage and tamed, because Chia is home to man's highest spirit and to God's lowest flesh. Just as the spirit of a man may seem tamed, it is nothing beside it. How fair is the Lord! And this is very good, for God has given each of his angels right judgment, that is, mercy, and his own ideas see out through their eyes. So Thoth and Shiva may serve us just as much as Michael or Jesus for all are spirits of the realm of Neshima. For some of those spirits have fallen and seek to deceive us and draw us away from the clear light, either when we choose to or only if we have become very deceived do we incarnate. So we say that some spirits of the realm of pure geometry, the fifth dimension, that of the pure light, are guides to the realms of purity, even greater than that of invisible geometric light. Others, however, try to drag us downward and back into the realms of fourth-dimensional electromagnetic entropy. Those for whom we feel pity are angels of the Lord, too, but, like Satan tempting us to avoid charity, they cling to our sorrows and leave a trail of effect behind us. However, whether the Grigori or fallen Anunnaki spirits or those of Jakaida will guide us in our will, our Chia, our gut instinct is determined by our own level of enlightenment of the watchful eye over them. The Jakaida or true will the holy guardian angel, peak transcendental experience level of each and every little speck of an individual is higher than even the spirit of man, which is governed over by the alignment of the lesser willed Chia. 
However, remember that the spirit or highest conceptual aspect of man is only the lowest flesh of Kabbalah. This is not, as some might assume, because God is upside down from the transcendental ascension of man. That is Satan, also known in this case as the constellation Orion. God is both rising and falling at once, as well as neither rising and only either or the other. He is all these things. His is the ultimate will, of which Jakaida is only one small ripple of a reflection. However, Jakaida, the holy guardian angel, is the highest will of man. Beyond this, one ceases to be mortal, or rather, ceases to see their self-concept mortality as central. The self-concept of themselves as mortal is contingent on the degradation of their DNA. If the DNA's lifespan were prolonged naturally, the thoughts of mortality would begin to fade. And if the DNA's lifespan were prolonged indefinitely by artificial means, then the mind would be completely transformed into a non-mortal entity, as it truly is anyway, since the mind is only a part of the body so long as the body is alive, but that, beyond this, in the form of energy, and then in the form of only a pattern of clear light, the mind does live on after this. The mind as it is now, descended into the thrice cursed body, the thrice descended pit below the soul, has its true throne of origin above the one body, above the many bodies, above the many souls, above the one soul. Truly, the spirit, the pure geometric pattern or Neshima, clear light of man, is ever bowed before Jakaida, the gates of the realm in which dwells the Most High and the Holy Host. Just as the soul is immortal by nature, so too can the mind's lowest concept of itself also become immortal, even seemingly eternal, but on a cosmic scale such spans mean nothing. Truly, the immortality of the soul will outlast any form of immortality of the body, and the eternity of the spirit, of the tamed Chia aligned with Jakaida, the holy guardian angel, will outlast even the longest conceptual extension of the immortal soul by an even exponentially greater duration so too is the spirit, the geometry of phi over pi, the clear light of the fifth dimension, nothing before the almighty ascension of God. That is why we, true Illuminati, scoff even at the quest for life extension of the Rosicrucian alchemists, because we know it is our deeds that determine our destiny and not our interior designs. Just as there is no one right interior form, neither of DNA nor of thought, there can be no one right being to ascend to the nether realms. All we need to shape tomorrow is here, now. To embrace any form of immortality is to cling to the notion of mortality. In other words, the Chia is tamed when it realizes that it must compromise upon serving time as an angel in the realm of Neshima, either as an Anunnaki, one of the fallen and perpetually lamenting, or as a holy guardian angel over a lesser soul. Only then can the spirit rightly be saved from this willing compromise and ascend into the realms of Jakaida. This is the noble beast, heart of an Illuminati. When you know this, you will know to whom to give what grip, 
and when saluting anyone, you shall know who among them can see by the shining. This concludes the knowledge lecture on the traits of the perfect Illuminati. Here is a knowledge lecture for the various titles of the seven degree Bohemian camp. The first title is Area. An area is comprised of districts. In each district there are regions. In each region there are lodges. A lodge of four masters represents an area, a district, a region, and the lodge. A lodge of five masters also sends forth an ambassador between one lodge and another. So in each great area lies a grand district, and in each district a vast region, and from each lodge in every region, district, and area come a grand master, a Rosicrucian of the region, an Illuminatus of the district, and an OTO area chair. The OTO area chair governs the five lodge roles in the Senate as chief intelligence officer. Next down on a lodge bench, the district Illuminatus represents the lodge members less initiated than the five bench members to the regional Rosicrucian. The Rosicrucian's job is to come up with possible options for solutions to any intra-lodge issues. They relay their results to the lodge Grand Master of the Essene York Rite Zealots whose job it is in Lodge to compare the agendas of the Rosicrucian, acting intra-Lodge, and the OTO, whose information is relayed to them in turn by the Lodge Ambassador. The OTO and Ambassador sit on the Lodge GM's left, and the Rosicrucian and Illuminati sit to the GM's right. So the interests of the greater area, comprised of the current ambassador's entire prior circuit of no fewer than four lodges, are represented by a permanent position in each lodge, though they receive their own orders only indirectly via those ambassadors. Therefore, trust your visiting Scottish knight Relay your interpretation wisely to your Lodge Grand Master. Allow them, with patience, to weigh your own report against that of the Lodge Rosicrucian. The Rosicrucian must trust their Lodge Illuminati, and you, as the OTO, must trust your visiting ambassador. Such are the lines drawn on the floor of the Senate where the Rosicrucians and Illuminati are the bench speakers, alternates for the chair or throne if the OTO cannot be represented, and the Scottish Knight protects the OTO chair. In Lodge, the GM is the administrator, but in the Senate, they are the furthest guard away from the area chair. But what is the meaning of an area represented as the circuit of the visiting ambassador, interpreted to the local Lodge GM by the OTO, who sits as chair of a Lodge's bench in the Sublime Senate? The Rosicrucians, the blue isosahedron, consider their region of governance to represent the realm of spirit, or Neshima, the ubiquitous phi over pi spiral measuring perfect perpetual periodicity. If the Neshima is only Rosicrucian, to what Empyrean heights must the OTO chair bear treasure from? The OTO, through military-funded experiments with ZPE, has ascertained that the area equivalent to that overseen by an OTO member 
extends beyond C, the speed of light in space-time. Thus, the OTO chair recognizes that pi is greater than phi, which itself is greater than their difference, phi divided by pi. Thus, we see that our area of governance extends beyond the fourth spatial Rosicrucian tesseract, beyond C, to see the true light of tachyon shining through the black holes surrounding darkness, invisible before the inversion of C, the bright darkness at the edge of our own continuum, such as illumination. For above the Rosicrucian tesseract of time, Tao sub Tao, and beyond the Illuminati, clear light, sits the area chair of the OTO, the entire vista rolled out like a tapestry before our throne. An area, thus, called within the OTO, a camp also, consists of all that can be seen from the positions of the Most High in the Order, i.e. the Pope. That is to say, the OTO chair looks out across all history, all time and space, all the higher spirits, the gloom of tachyons, the tesseract of fourth spatial time, the equivalent of C squared, it sees from the capstone's point of view and can overlook everything that has gone before. Truly, a wise area director will govern by deference, the friend of the ambassador and the trustworthy confidant of the Lodge GM, and lead according to their equality with their fellow members, seeing themselves also as dependent on the ambassador just as the Rosicrucians and Illuminati are upon the Lodge GM. To neglect wisdom in governing over an area, or representing the area's government's administration in a group of other locals, is to commit the lowest form of folly. To neglect wise government is to be embraced by the cyclone that killed Zeus. This is why we call our area a camp, because, just as the many area officers from the many lodges throughout the land, all within regions, all within districts, all within the greater areas themselves, act similarly to an axon dendrite gap between a lodge neuron and an ambassador neurotransmitter, Thus, they cathect the wills of each lodge via the ambassador, Chi, and form the offices of orders above them via hypercathexis of additional amounts of ego accumulation per nerve cell or lodge. Therefore, the officers of the York, Scottish, Rosicrucian, Illuminati, and OTO are all superlative to merely their stationary positions in the Lodge as officers. Each OTO officer, for example, is independent from every other officer of their own rank, aside from via the ambassador. Yet we say that these all collectively form the order of the OTO. Now, there is no necessary head of these orders. The members in each lodge form a network, and this itself is like a nervous system of lodges in which develops the variegated roles of self-awareness. So, if asked by a non-order member, explain to them about primacy versus recency, and explain to them about the ghostly officers of the ascended masters, how they correspond to this color, that shape, this order, this lodge office, etc. But do not bother trying to explain to them beyond this as to who exactly fills these offices, these chief executives of the orders, who dictate 
our ranks and explain our roles and the rules of our roles and by no means bother attempting to explain to the uninitiated that these four area directors of the OTO are only four of seven, while the other three, the OHO, the IHO, and Pope, are essentially public positions. Therefore, behold, we area directors hold the most powerful position in all the land. The executive committee is four-seventh comprised of area directors. In a closed base four session or an open base five senate, there are only four area directors presiding as the chief executive governing body. The other three are either silent as in a presiding IHO and OHO under the Pope of the Order of Death, or public, as in literally open to first come, first serve entitlement to petition of redress of grievances. Thus the area directors act as base four within seven in Senate, even though each is only one of five from a lodge. Therefore, just as each area director acts in a lodge, so too do they act in the Senate, and by their combinations of numbers comprise either a single officer from each lodge or a group of four or five senatorial chairs in a base four open or a base five closed session, respectively. As lodge members, our primary oath of allegiance is to the area or judicial court of the Scott Knight Ambassador and to the Senate network. Beside the Senate, each OTO lodge member is only a single individual, but in the Senate, the OTO chairs convene the actually Bohemian Order, or OTO. That is why this area is called a camp. The second title is Green. Now, green juxtaposes, or flashes, against orange, whose opposite color is indigo. This is why the OTO connects with the Scottish Rite of Masonry, because, just as Orange Knights Zion flash opposite indigo York Rite GMs, so too does the green OTO chair flash opposite the orange ambassadors. Green also juxtaposes, or flashes, opposite red and violet, and thus the role of the OTO chairs over areas is inimically influenced by and infused with the red column that proceeds beneath the orange ambassadors through the spectral orders to the violet column directly opposite, underneath the indigo cube of the York GMs. However, the flashing of green opposite orange and indigo, and the flashing of green opposite red and violet are no great mysteries. Green also flashes opposite yellow and blue as well green flashes against every other color of the rainbow. The reason for this is that the albedo of green is exactly a one-to-one -one ratio blending of white light and black color as gray. Any adjustment to the tone of green represents a lighter or darker hue of gray. This tone of gray is also equivalent to any shade of color combinations. Thus, green contains the whole gradient of gray tones, and each gray tone is likewise reflecting an equivalent amount of light to the tone of another shade of another hue. This is why, in lower levels, I have described the air and clouds as green themselves, the median tone of their combined component colors, and the green foliage of leaves on plants and trees I have described as roseate. The green color is the gray light reflection. 
between yellow sunlight and blue H2O. Likewise, all colors that are absorbed, reflecting only the color we see, are equivalent to mere albedo tones of gray light, and likewise they are all equivalent to shades of any color, such as is native to earth, the color green. That is why green flashes with every other color in the rainbow. It is merely the combination of all hues rendering white and all colors rendering black that is then toned up or down by adding either white or shadows. The result is gray tone. However, it appears green to our eyes here and now because beneath C, photon light splits into the seven color spectrum and all light is tinted. Scientists will generally reject such abstract claims as that green is gray tone in color because gray tone is each shade of every hue and color, but the evidence that green flashes against every single other color of the rainbow is nonetheless indisputable and irrefutable. Green flashes against every other hue in the light spectrum because it is a non-color, the color equivalent of diffuse pale light. Its albedo is equal to red and to violet, but its tone is opposite. The result is juxtaposition or flashing. Likewise, green is darker than orange, but brighter than indigo. And likewise, green is darker than yellow, but brighter than blue. Green, therefore, flashes in sequence between equal albedo red and violet across the scale of other spectral hues, appearing darker than orange and yellow on one side, and brighter than indigo and blue on the other. Green is gray in color. Just as flashing occurs between colors of opposite hue, so too is it caused by their opposing tones of albedo. This is why green can flash both light or dark opposite every spectral hue. It is the middle color of the rainbow, just as gray is between extreme light and shadow. Moreover, just as all colors sum black and all hues sum white, green is amidst all hues, within white, along with the others, but green is also the secondary color combination between primaries yellow and blue, which are the brightest, highest albedo, and darkest, lowest albedo of the primaries. The other primary is red, and it also flashes with green, because red and green have equal albedo, but opposite tone. Therefore, green flashes with every other hue in the spectrum, because it is a midpoint between the full spectrum of white light and the deeper tones of the shared hues, that is, ultimately, merely the amount of and not color of light they reflect. In short, green is the central hue, a secondary color, and a tone with albedo equal to perfect gray. That is why green flashes with every other color. Green is tonally neutral, flashes opposite every hue, and is a secondary color because it is central to the odd number-based color spectrum because it is between bright red and dark violet, and because it therefore has no innate tone of its own. Green is a non-color, the absence of tone. Again, green is the color version of gray. The third title is Tetrahedron. The tetrahedron is a symbol of the all-seeing eye. Its three faces above a fourth see all from their rotating position atop the capstone. Whether surmounting a pyramid or an arch, 
the role of the capstone is the same. It marks the end that is the middle. For here is a mysterious aspect of the tetrahedron capstone. The end of time is the center space of the completed great work. Now look, look around, look everywhere. Nowhere will you find the single center point of the cosmos, that vacuum cavity void that is the surface of the supermassive black hole that consumes us from beyond outward. There is no precise location for the first disturbance of energy and antimatter creating matter. This is, just so, the lesson of the Holy Lands, where the scriptures are maintained in a growing desert climate, because there is no known location for Mount Hosea, the mountain of Moses in Zion, called later Mount Horeb and associated with Mount Hebron in Sinai. Of course, this mystical mountain will not be found so many thousands of years later, because, though the area remains the same, the terrain has changed. Why is this? Why is there no present, fixed, or mobile position for the Big Bang? Scientists assure us space is expanding outward ubiquitously, this spreading out occurring in Hilbert space between quanta. However, where is it going? Why do we not see space thinning out like stretched rubber? It is because space is being pulled upward from beyond its fastest speed, c. It is because quantum attraction gradually repels as well. And it is because we exist at a midpoint between quantum decohesion and the simultaneous and perpetual filtering of matter into pure energy by consumption through black holes. The Big Bang of quantum expansion never ended, and so neither shall the simultaneous and perpetual Big Crunch of matter being swallowed up and shredded by black holes. The Big Bang and Big Crunch are both going on even now. The purpose of the tetrahedron is to represent the peak human experience. The Rosicrucian Neshima is the measure of phi over pi. Thus, phi is greater than the Neshima of phi over pi, and so it sits on one side as the pillar called by the Illuminati Chia. So too is pi greater than phi, and so it sits off to the other side as the pillar called by we Bohemians, the pillar of Jakaida. Atop the arch between these two pillars is the Neshima, the measure of phi over pi. So one pillar, Chia, is phi, and the other is Jakaida, pi and the capstone between them is the measure of their difference, phi over pi. Thus, even though the Jakaida and Chia support the Neshima, like pillars holding up an arch, the Neshima is the spirit, and thus equivalent to the fifth element, and therefore the tetrahedron is truly a symbol of the Neshima. However, it is of the Neshima upraised by the alignment of Jakaida and Chia, the pillars beneath it. The tetrahedron as a symbol of the Neshima represents the peak endurance point for the operating system experiencing the appraisal, i.e., the Neshima of phi over pi is only a measuring device for the vector system of the Jakaida and Chia. It is Jakaida that causes the peak experience, Chia that allows it, and the Neshima that experiences it. 
Therefore, just as the tetrahedron sits above the seven-color archway, whose pillars are red and violet, it symbolizes or refers to the Neshima atop the archway of Jakaida and Chia. Therefore, think of the green Bohemian tetrahedron as the highest point above the spectral arch, but also of the lowest point of the archway above of the twin pillars, Jakaida and Chia. Think thus of the rainbow archway below and the phi over pi arch above, but think of the green tetrahedron as the capstone of both. The rainbow archway of the seven colors, chakras, bay of Ra, degrees of our order, etc., is right side up. Beneath the archway of phi over pi, upside down, above. Therefore, the green tetrahedron flashes against the colors below it, and therefore the Neshima is the stable base below the Chikaida and Chia. Because the green tetrahedron is central and supernal to the other base five solids and base seven colors, it is associated with the Neshima or spirit that is the Ak supernal to the seven chakras, the Bay of Ra, and the Aura, the Ka, of the soul, the Ruach. Yet, the green tetrahedron, the juncture point or crux between the archway below and the upside-down archway above, is only symbolic of Neshima as such. Just as the Rosicrucian knows with certainty that their blue isosahedron of air represents the Neshima, and the Illuminati can tell you their yellow dodecahedron represents the Chia, you as a Bohemian Templar need to know that your green tetrahedron's meaning is that the seven chakra over aura-based soul of man contains all the other components of one, the ak, the body or nefesh, two, the ka, the ruach aura or energy double, three, the seven bay of ra, the seven color chakras, Four, the Ak, or Neshima, spirit. Five, Chia, the lesser will. And six, Jakaida, the higher will, all contained within a single system. The seventh chakra, and thus one's entire soul, contains these six lesser aspects. We call this whole soul, containing the six lesser components of nefesh, chakras, ruach, neshima, jakaida, and chia, adam kadman. The seventh self is the whole system of lesser selves before they became distinguished. The lesser selves are like the organs of the seventh self's body. Just as in Lodge we learn the nature of the four worlds of Kabbalah, so in our orders do we learn of the five components of our Kadman self, chakras, ruach, etc., apart from the physical shell self, the nefesh, or ashlar self, as equivalent to five solids, which are then also equivalent to the four universal elemental forces under the fifth force spirit. But in our orders we are shown these meanings in an encrypted format. Just as we are told the green tetrahedron is the highest of the five solids, highest of the five elements, highest of the six parts of our or parts of Vim, Cadman self, highest of the seven colors, etc., so we see these different number scales for relative attributes have been fixed such that they align in a way meaningful to the mind. In point of fact, however, all symbols are arbitrary, to some degree more or less, 
depending on their accompanying explanations. Now, this is why the green tetrahedron symbolizes Neshima, is relative to Jakaida, is equivalent to the true light of fifth dimensional tachyons, etc. It is because the most current form of degree system per order is considered the most important among the order of death, and thus emphasis of rank is placed upon it. But I tell you truly, just as the double arch of seven colors below the phi over pi capstone and the twin pillars of Chia and Jakaida above, so too is our order arranged, the twin pillars of church and state upside down above the capstone over the seven colors of five orders and the twin pillars of red and violet. What is red below violet is state, and what violet below red, church. And so too the temptations of Adam and paradise, the fruits of immortality and omniscience, are hung above the seventh self, Cadman, or Christ, consciousness, which is above the other colors and flashes against them, and these lower colors are only the chakras, the Bay of Ra, inside the aura, the Ka, of this, our own peak experience, best memory, or highest self. The fourth title is Tachyons. Tachyons are the true or greater light of the fifth dimension. The shapes of fourth dimensional space that cast their shadows as aperiodic cycles of time in the third dimension are illuminated by the pure, clear, invisible light above C in the fifth dimension. Just as four space seems to us expressible only as pure geometry, then the fifth space can only be calculable by pure mathematics. However, our own consciousness can enter five space and even look down through pure geometric four space upon the entire physical composition and cycle of creation and destruction of our entire physical existence. Four space surrounds our own three-dimensional reality with shadow like an eclipsing moon obscuring the luminous, limitless, still and calm, shimmering effervescence of the clear, true light of five spatial tachyons. The force of light is carried on two kinds of particle. Below C, the speed of light in a perfect vacuum, the particles carrying the force of light are the very large, though theoretically massless, i.e. without electromagnetic charge, spin zero, or rather as it is of one dimension, a ray or wavelength that, by quantum uncertainty, can be compressed into a point particle for a minimum duration, photon. Above C, which supersedes the imperfect vacuum of background radiation in deep space, the force-carrying particle unit of light is called a tachyon. Just as a wavelength for a photon ray exists as a disturbance to a field or field-like medium of quantum foam background zero-point energy, so does the photon particle emit Cherenkov radiation, smaller particles of illumination, from its surface. Just as these particles of Cherenkov radiation emanate out before the future trajectories of the photon as a ray or particle, so it is said the light from tachyons reaches us before the sights we see by photons so too can the mind perceive the current conditions of our spatial reality, 
even though the photons we observe with our eyes left their origins several billion years before we see them now. The shape of the tachyon particle is a torus, and the measure of a vector on its surface we render as the spiral within and around the torus, phi over pi. Holographically, the multiverse surrounding our universe after critical mass is a torus comprised of pure tachyonic light, each microwave length of which measures phi over pi. This hypersphere of the multiverse surrounding our universe also extends around in a torus over extremely long durations. On the opposite end of this cycle from our universe is the nulliverse of pure energy, pure light, from only one singularity inside a much more vast black hole within our parent universe. Just as a black hole in our universe spits out less energy than the amount of matter it takes in, and this additional consumed matter is inverted into the quantity of energy, antimatter from our point of view, discharged into the subquantum baby universe inside the singularity inside the black hole. So too is our own cosmos merely a baby universe in a torus cycle of pure light inside a massive black hole within our own parent universe. Most of the n-dimensional parent universe beyond our own three dimensions that is taken in as matter is converted into energy. Only a very minute portion filters through, down, and into our own 3D universe, which, since critical mass, is being consumed outward, i.e. expanding, faster than new zero-point energy enters our space-time realms. All of this can be known to the mind, even though, as of yet, none has been witnessed by the eye. It is tachyons that enable ESP. Merely project your meaning by visualizing an image of it being transferred from yourself to your subject, and eventually you will be able to move objects at will mentally. Tachyons or microwave subquantum gravity act as a field or fluid medium in which such thought, image, or will projection can occur. Inside your brain, when you imagine an image, the neurotransmitters create a holographic interpretation as an electrical waveform pattern between certain connected neurons. The medium of subquantum zero-point energy is where the potential energy accumulates inside the charged neurons, allowing them to form a hologram mimicking the actual image, shape, subject, or object. The realms beyond the biological confines of nerve cells are of the same stuff, substance, medium, or field as the thoughts preceding our subsequent chemical cascades. All this universal reality is the same at its most basic level, and this level acts in accord to the will of our consciousness. Just as the will originates from the brain and travels down my arm to guide my hand as I write this, the thoughts we catch in our neural nets are, in some shape or form, ubiquitous to our reality. Just as the hand guides the pen, so too can the will travel beyond the body. Thus ESP is possible, and thus direct intent can be accomplished mentally. All reality is thought. At the level of tachyons, the speed of C squared, thoughts occur. The fifth title is Saturn. 
While the OTO attributes of the area of governorship over tachyons by the mind and the platonic, regular, solid of the tetrahedron are both from base five systems. The color green and the planet Saturn are base seven. As I have said elsewhere, in Atlantis, there was no speculative form of masonry and there was no religion. There was no need for either and it is the esoteric exoteric division between these two that causes both to exist. They need each other. The reason for the creation of esoteric Freemasonry and monotheist religion was the flood. At the time the world's entire prior history was destroyed. Two cults formed. One blamed the flood on only one of a pantheon of deities. The other blamed the pantheon and believed only one god had saved them. The evidence for the latter is the so-called Rainbow Covenant of Noah, renewed by the Ten Commandments of Moses. Noah, Moses, and their descendants all believed in the monotheist savior deity who promised never again to destroy mankind by flood. Of course, in South America, the pantheist religions preserved a different tradition. According to them, the earth and its populations had been destroyed twice before the flood as well. Once by air, the equivalent of the fall of the rebel angels, and once by earth, the so-called fall of man. The flood, then, would be followed later by a destruction by fire. The pantheists of Sumer invented a new science to predict when the next cataclysm would occur, even though, according to the monotheists, who claim exemption, we can neither know the hour nor the day of its coming, which will be like a thief in the night. If we cause it ourselves, it will be through science versus religion, and thus only democracy will be the victim. The new science of the antediluvian pantheists was called astrology, and it was, and is, base 12. Every 2,000 solar orbits, according to the base 12 calendar of astrology, Earth enters a new age, or aeon, or sign. This is equivalent to one's own rising sign in their birth chart. The sun sign now is fixed to the last aeon, 2,000 to 4,000 years before now, 4,000 to 2,000 years later. Likewise, there are signs for each planet besides the sun as well, even including Earth's moon, out to Saturn. This is how we date the calendar and thus measure Earth's exact location to calculate its seasons, cycles, eclipses, etc., even over very long durations, such as the tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years between ice ages, etc. The calendar of astrology, used openly by the esoteric pantheists and secretly by the exoteric monotheists, is, in point of fact, incomplete. So are the South American calendars and those of East Asia. Only when all are combined into one single system can we begin to restore the entire global Atlantean calendar. Just as the Western business calendar used among the modern monotheists measures rotations, day and night, per lunation, month, Per solar orbit, year, so did the Atlantean calendar measure all these for all seasons, I Ching, of Earth, our 24,000 year base 12 cycle, and of every other planet, the Tzolkin, in our solar system, 
as well as the longer cycles of our place in the Milky Way galaxy, the Great Cycle. The Atlantean calendar system frames the 64 base I Ching, 36 base deacons of the base 12 zodiac, the base 7 planets, base 3 elements, combining as base 10, hence the Sephirah, the base 4 and the base 5 elements, as the solid states or forms of the acacia, the spirit element, all upon the base 144 system devised by John D. It shows us that the acacia or spirit element separates the 4 from the 20 and the 4 from the 16, leaving the 12. However, the base 10 system reduces by 3 to the base 7 system if either 4 are omitted, leaving 16 or 12. If the base 20 of 5 by 4 remains, though, the base 10 system becomes base 13. Thus, these numbers, the base 5 system and the base 13 system, are unique to the Atlantean calendar. Their equivalents, thus, in the Enochian system of the Golden Dawn, were the base 4 system and the base 7 system, respectively. The base 4 plus 3 equals the base 7, and so the base 4 times 3 equals the base 12 system. Therefore, the key to the Enochian system is base 3. However, the equivalent key for the Atlantean calendar is base 4, as 4 times 5 equals 20, and 13 times 4 equals 52, an Aztec century. Thus, 23 is a symbol of the base 4 and base 3 systems of the true Atlantean calendar and the Golden Dawn Enochian systems combined. It is this same way we can come to understand why, at the time of the flood and the loss of the original complete Atlantean calendar, the base 5 system became supplanted by the base 4 system, because the 7 plus 5 became the 12. The six chief executives and the Pope of Atlantis, also called the Ten Kings in seven places of the seven antediluvian kings of Sumer, at the time of the Great Flood, came together and created the base seven laymen of angelic sigils in their places in the zodiac. This layman was given to Noah, Zayasudra or Utnapishtim, and saved from the flood, but subsequently was broken into seven pieces by Moses. The seven pieces, or glyphs, became the seven places in the zodiac and archangelic sigils known to the esoteric, pantheistic, and masonic practitioners of astrology as the seven planets in the twelve signs of the zodiac. Thus, five were said to rule two each and two to rule one more each. It was the flood that destroyed Atlantean democracy, based on number theory, and gave birth to monotheism, just as it was the flood that dispersed the components of the Atlantean calendar and gave birth to astrology. Monotheism replaced the calendar and astrology replaced democracy. Now, Democrats are labeled pantheists, believers in a just government, mere idealists, and the highest authority in all the land is the false pope. However, there is hope for those who wish to restore the ideals of Atlantis and Eden to reality. According to all who admit to the inevitability of the coming destruction by fire, there remains the promise of peace in an age governed by the fifth element, spirit that will come following the fire that purges. At this time, 
we may yet see the right understanding of Atlantis we have now, finally shared by all, in place of the mere belief in monotheism and the doubt of astrology as a pseudoscience. The authentic tradition preserves the attribute of the planet Saturn as a placeholder, representing the angelic sigil of one Atlantean chief executive at the time of the flood. Likewise, this angelic sigil, equivalent to Saturn, has a place in the zodiac over two signs of the astrological zodiac. However, these two signs of Saturn likewise only refer back to its place in the zodiac of seven glyphs. Understanding this, one understands all. The twelve and the seven are both from seven originally. The sixth and seventh titles are Aquarius and Capricorn. When the spring equinox rising sign was Aquarius, the north hemisphere was in a spring season following the electromagnetic pole reversal that unfroze America and froze Antarctica. As the American ice sheet melted, it rose worldwide sea levels. As Antarctica glaciated, it receded them again though by then many coastlines had shifted. This was the beginning of the dispersion of the Atlantean and Arctic people to form the culture of Lemuria, the global coastal civilizations that raised the Shems, Henges, and Mynheers of the Neolithic period of Neanderthal and Homo sapien cohabitation. The first Homo sapien, Atlantean, Lemurian, remains are found in South Africa, Australia, and South America. In Israel, north migrating Homo sapiens and south migrating Neanderthal cohabited, generating the originally Neanderthal myth of the fallen angels, etc. By this time, the spring equinox rising sign had preceded one sign into Capricorn. Saturn is the third Camia number square, and the first in the magical ordering of the planets, skip two heptagram, within the seven-day week heptagon, based on these. Thus, being opposite sun and moon, Saturn is the only single planet to govern two consecutive signs of the zodiac in the 7 and 12 system symbolizing the Camia. It should be noted that the layman representing the Camia, arranged around a spiral of Pythagorean triangles, the seven archangelic sigils on the seven glyph places in the zodiac, and the layman symbolizing the relationship between these seven sigils and the base 12 post-deluge zodiac are compatible, though only strangely, but that they are, structurally, two very different compositions. The Pythagorean spiral arrangement is square-shaped in its basic components. The base 12 zodiac is circular. This is why the tetrahedron is associated with cosmos according to modern attribution, rather than the elder Greek attribution of the dodecahedron. It is base 7, 3 plus 4, and base 12, 3 times 4, whereas the dodecahedron is base 12 and base 5. Hence, the dodecahedron is associated with Illuminati democracy and the subsequent religions of astrology. Thus, the tetrahedron contains, in its very shape, the key of it all. Saturn, as ruler over the consecutive signs, Aquarius and Capricorn, in the base 12 zodiac, and as Camia, number square, 
in the base 7 Pythagorean arrangement can thus be plotted on two kinds of layman. Now apply the green tetrahedron. Apply the key. By distorting the topography of the two flat laymans, we can add another layer of meaning by which to correspond them. Thus, fold up the squares to form the three-sided corner of a cube. Thus, twist the zodiac to form the torus from the circle. Just as the circle bisects the sphere, so too does the twisted or looped base 12 circular zodiac bisect the torus. Just as the loop bisected torus measures the phi over pi spiral on its surface, so too can the bent or folded Pythagorean arrangement map the same spiral. The procession of Pythagorean expansion of the Kamiya base units that is caused by the phi ratio triangles of the central equiangular spiral can be graphed onto the pi spiral, rectilinear and equiangular, as opposed to triangular and equiangular, while the layman shape is still a flat plane. Thus, when the layman is folded up one dimension, both phi and pi will appear. The tetrahedron as keystone, the rulership of Saturn over Aquarius and Capricorn, the placement of the third camia in the 3D phi over pi version of the square layman, the aeons of the zodiac, the cataclysms that destroyed Atlantis. None of these things are random. All are carefully planned, artfully crafted, and skillfully observed. There is, therefore, order in the universe. It cannot, hence, be said, all is chaos. The eighth title is Jakaida. Do the true will. This is the law. Yet still incendiaries here and there ask, What is the true will? And how must we sacrifice to inherit rewards in the afterlife? What then is the true law if you know not the true will? And if you know not the true will as law, then no amount of sacrifice will do. Instead, petty narcs and ne'er-do-wells have purloined Thelema from its guru and greet one another with the blasphemy, My will or your will be done. No, a thousand times no. If love is the law, love under will, then the will is above and, as its spirit infuses the law, the law is animate only by the will. Yet the modern Thelemites understand nothing. They believe in the will as law and recognize only their own will as the most high. They err. They believe the law should read, the law is love under will. It is not. To deny this fact is to deny one's own freedom. No, the law does not state, do what you wilt. It states quite plainly, do what thou wilt. The high form of thee, thou, is used only in addressing adult males and is equivalent to the title, Lord. This indicates the high English of Liber Al Val Legis is meant to be addressed to the monotheistic version of the deity. Thus, do what thou wilt, becomes the law, also, of Christ, given by Jesus to Pilate and the sectarian Sanhedrin. 
Christ debunked addressing the fallen state and the monotheist church. Crowley thus cast no pearls before swine. His audience was everyone, all of us now, and all those gone before and yet to come. Crowley gave the law of do what thou wilt to us all, and thus debunked the entire Christian morality. As Crowley put it, I drank and danced all night with doubt, and awoke to find her a virgin in the morning. Martyrdom is false morality. However, now, only 100 years into it, Thelema has been co-opted by godless lawbreakers and bloodless vampire politicians. Moreover, most people miss the fact that the Apocalypse of St. John, the so-called Book of Revelations of the Roman Catholic New Testament, has already concluded occurring. The work, though entirely allegorical for the politics and priests of the day, was intentionally played out on the world stage during the 20th century. Crowley played the part of the great beast. Jones, a cod, was his prophet. Mathers, Waite, and Rigardi were, like the three other stooges, the three prophets of God, the false prophet deposed and left unburied. Their wrathful ghosts became Hitler, Mussolini, and first Lenin, then Stalin. The Battle of Armageddon at Armageddon was actually fought between British imperialists and fascist-backed Arabs in World War II. This is a fact recorded in the annals of military history. The remainder of the 20th century saw a rapid buildup of doomsday weapons and the creation of a false state of Israel. As the book says, I am the warrior god of the 40s. The 80s cower before me and are abased. While we entered the 20th century, a planet of disparate peoples, we leave it much more globally unified, however armed to the teeth, with enough ammo to destroy the world a hundred times over. And this all brings us back to the turn of the millennium and a world suddenly usurped in every way by the Neo-Sethians. Beware, wise and noble scholar, like disenchanted Jesuits, like spies left out in the cold, like burnouts, and the wanderers and fools they are. These secular Neo-Sethians, believers in the second coming of Jesus Christ, are invading the POD via the OTO degree. Most are simple Neo-Nazis, some are crypto-fascists calling themselves neoconservatives. They all share the belief, also held to be true 2,000 years ago, about Jesus, that he will now, as the Sethites believed he had then, appear again. The Sethites believed Seth, first wise mortal born, was the first messiah. They accepted Jesus as the second coming of Seth and imbued him with all the magical abilities due a holy ghost who came and possessed Jesus now, then someone else, then Judas, or Peter, then Jesus again, etc. This is the Christ consciousness of modern trance channelers called also Kether, or the crown of thorns of global and universal psychic awareness that is then passed around and shared among only a few. In order to preserve the possibility for the restoration of the Atlantean democracy, 
We need to do away with all such types of monotheist mumbo-jumbo and gibberish. Superstition is a useful instinct, but ideals are more than only 2,000 years old and anthropomorphized as Jesus. If you want to uphold true ideals, look further. By studying cycles, looking ahead will soon become as easy as looking back. Eventually, all will become clear for each. When one group of psychics uses the myths of monotheism to suppress another group's right to self-expression, free thought, and thus deprives them of their God-given ESP, this group of soul killers are rightly called a psychic conspiracy. But I tell you, not all psychics are in on the conspiracy. This concludes the knowledge lecture on the traits of the Bohemian OTO.